Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April meeting of the Governmental Accounting Standards Advisory Council. I am the GAS Act Chair, Rob Hamilton. I am the State Controller for the State of Oregon. Uh, just thank you all for making the time to, to attend and prepare for this meeting. Just really appreciate um, the upcoming conversation. Um, one of the things I first wanted to start with, if there is a, um, hopefully y'all got a chance to, to review the minutes and if there is a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? All right. Um, I'm going to go um, all in favor. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. It's a unanimous pass. Um, so one of the things I wanted to uh, mention for folks is uh, we are going to go around the room here in a moment. If you could please share your name and the organization that you represent. Um, if we could also just know that you might want to take like a brief breath uh, before you speak as after you hit your, your microphone, uh, that'll give a chance for uh, the microphone to pop on and then also for the cameras to catch up. I'm going to start off to my right with Lisa and then we'll just go around the room uh, and then with Lisa Washburn. So Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Parker. I am on the GASB staff and I also serve as the GAS Act coordinator. Good Good afternoon. My name is John Lazuski. I'm the Commissioner of Finance for the City of Yonkers, third largest city in the state of New York, and I'm representing the Conference of Mayors. And I am Bob Scott. I am Deputy Town Manager, Chief Financial Officer for the Town of Prosper, Texas, which is a Dallas suburb, and I am representing GFOA. Good afternoon. I'm Joni Davis. I'm the accounting manager for the Nebraska Public Power District, and I am representing the American Public Power Association. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Thomas. I'm a partner with Butler Snow Law Firm in Denver, Colorado, and I am representing the National Association of Bond Lawyers. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Knight, GASB board member. Good afternoon. I'm Harriet Richardson um, here from Washington State. I'm representing the Association of Local Government Auditors. Good afternoon. John Auchincloss. I am the Executive Director of the Foundation. Roberta Reese, Gasby Staff. Chris Clark. I am the Legislative Auditor for the State of Kansas. I am representing the National Conference of State Legislatures. Hello, I'm Zach Jackson. I'm representing the National Association of State Budget Officers. Uh, I've been the State Budget Director of Indiana for the last five years and in the Budget Office for 19 years. Uh, but as of last week, I'm now the uh, CFO and Controller for the City of Carmel, a, um, a suburb of Indianapolis. Hi, I'm Sophia DiCaro. I'm uh, the Executive Director of the Utah Governor's Office of Planning and Budget, and I am representing uh, the uh, NGA, uh, National Governors Association. Thanks. Hi, I'm Debbie Miller. I am the Chief Fiscal Officer for the Illinois State Treasurer's Office, and I am representing the National Association of State Treasurers. I'm Brian Caputo. Gasby board member. I am Stephen Stewart. I represent the Governmental Research Association, and I'm a, the vice president and research director for the Bureau of Governmental Research in New Orleans, which is one of the member organizations. Good afternoon. I'm Hattie Mitchell, and I'm a senior manager travel consultant with RDW based out of Phoenix. And I am representing NAFOA, which is the Native American Financial Officer Association. Thank you. Good afternoon. Alan Skelton, Director of Research and Techno Activities here at the GASB, and welcome to Norwalk. Good afternoon. I'm Joel Black. I am the chair of the GASB. Hi, and I'm Jeff Praviti. I'm the vice chair of the GASB. Hi, I'm Suzanne Lowenson. I'm with the University of Vermont, and I represent the American Accounting Association. My name is Bob Bland. I'm a professor of public administration at the University of North Texas, and I am representing the Association for Budgeting and Financial Management. Diane Ray, GASB member. 
Uh, David Goldman, uh, Deputy City Administrator, Finance Director for the City of Oak Harbor, Washington, home of Naval Air Station Woodby Island. I represent the National League of Cities. Hello, I'm Christine Brock, uh, Assistant City Administrator, Chief Financial Officer for the City of Franklin, Tennessee. I'm with the uh, International City Managers Association. Good afternoon. I'm Jackie Reck. I'm a GASB member. Deborah Beams, Gasby staff. Cara Diana, Gasby staff. Uh, Matt Harvey, I'm a muni bond analyst at State Farm and I represent insurance industry investors. Um, Ileana Perez, I'm a credit analyst at PIMCO and I represent the Investment Company Institute. Rob Weber, uh, credit analyst at Moody's Investor Service uh, and I'm representing the bond raiders. Carolyn Smith, Gasby board member. Scott Devinney, I work for the Office of the Washington State Auditor, and I represent AGA. Good afternoon, Michelle Waterworth. I am an audit partner at Plant Moran, and I am representing the AICPA. Darren Tarleton, I'm a partner at Forbes, and I represent the Healthcare Financial Management Association. Hi, I'm Lisa Washburn. I work for Municipal Market Analytics, and I'm representing the National Federation of Municipal Analysts. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I, as I asked everyone to share the organization they represent, I realized I didn't share the organization I represent. So uh, I represent the National Association of State Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, or NASACT. Um, so I wanted to, uh, before we move on to the next agenda, I wanted to just uh, take a quick moment and, and uh, just, as people are sharing their perspectives, um, just know that you're, you're, you'll hear this from others. You're not asked to be, I think uh, Lisa's term, and I loved it so much, if you don't mind me stealing it, is to be a Gatsby geek. Uh, just want to um, encourage people to share their their perspectives, really what was the first thing that kind of came to mind, or maybe as you reflected on the topics a little bit as they were, as you read through them, what came to mind, what's the perspective that you would like to share on behalf of not only yourself, but also your organization, uh, we, uh, while we don't take formal votes and there's no counting of noses or anything like that, it's, it is a really valuable opportunity that we have as members of the GAS Act to provide our feedback to the GASB and its staff. So uh, please don't be um, reluctant to share your perspective, even if it is a matter of, of echoing uh, a comment. And please be specific with a comment when you do want to do that, not saying something along the lines of, I agree everything that Lisa said, even though I'm sure that I do. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, saying Lisa's specific comment around this particular item uh, resonated with me and I support the, what she had said. Um, but again, just want to encourage people to, to share the perspective that they have. Um, just again, this is such a unique and, and uh, valuable opportunity that we have to uh, provide feedback to the GASB and its staff. So um, without further ado, um, I will turn it over to uh, John Auchincloss for the report of the Financial Accounting Foundation. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, some of you that are new to this council um, will not realize that we do this regularly. We do a short report from the foundation just to bring you up to date on things that are the FAF Board of Trustees and, and um, have recently done and, and activities of the foundation. And speaking of our trustees, I, I would should note that three of our trustees were um, scheduled to be observing this meeting virtually. They are Manju Ganirawala, Marion G, both governmental trustees, and Beth Pierce are also a governmental trustee. So good representation uh, in this meeting, we hope. The Board of Trustees last meeting was on February 27th. And at that meeting, they appointed uh, Lisa Washburn to serve as vice chair of this council. As you just heard, and as you know, Lisa serves as Managing Director and Chief Credit Officer for Municipal Market Analytics, Inc., represents the National Federation of Municipal Analysts. She will serve as the Vice Chair for the remainder of her final term on the Council, um, which will last through the end of this year. The trustees also appointed two additional new GAS Act members, uh, in addition to those members that were appointed back in November of last year to replace Beth Pierce, who recently joined the FAF Board of Trustees. Uh, the trustees appointed Deborah Miller, Chief Financial Officer of the State of Illinois, representing National Association of State Treasurers, and to replace Chris Brown, who ended his term as controller for the city of Houston at the end of last year. 
David Goldman, who, as you've heard, is Deputy City Administrator for the City of Oak Harbor, Washington, and he represents the National League of Cities. Our trustees' next meeting will be on May 22nd and will take place in Washington, D.C. On the evening of Tuesday, May 21st, that we will be hosting a reception for, um, we hope, a large number of our stakeholders. So any of you who are in Washington, um, if you haven't been invited or your organization hasn't been invited, let us know. We'd be happy to invite you to that reception. I want to say a couple of words about our budget. Um, on February 22nd, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued an order that the proposed accounting support fees for the FASB are consistent with the requirements of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We wait on that order before we start collecting the accounting support fees for the GASB because the SEC looks at our entire budget. But, and since we've received that order, we will be commencing with a collection of both FASB and GASB accounting support fees for 2024. You will find the details of these accounting support fees and also of the FAFS 2024 budget and also the FAFS financial reports for the calendar year ended December 31st, 2023 on the FAFS website. And speaking of the FAFS website, we just recently rolled out three new and modernized websites for the GASB, the FASB, and the FAF. Uh, this is actually a fairly significant undertaking, one that we thought was critical to maintain and enhance transparency and ease of use for our stakeholders. If you haven't done so, I would encourage you to check out th these new sites. This and other technology projects are part of our rolling three-year strategic technology roadmap. The FAF trustees have reviewed and supported um, our IT initiatives plan for 2024 and approved the necessary funding as part of the FAF's overall 2024 budget. And later this year, we will be um, refreshing the three-year plan as we do every year to make sure we have both 2025 and then 26 and 27 technology projects um, in hand. So major commitment on the part of our trustees. It's also part of the FAST strategic plan to keep up to date with technology. And, um, and uh, we think that's critically important, again, in terms of transparency and ease of use for our stakeholders. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I will conclude my report, but I'd be happy to take any questions from the council. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any questions for Mr. Rockenklaus? All right. Seeing none, uh, now we'll turn it over to uh, Chair Black for a report of the Gatsby Chair. Thanks, Rob, and, and welcome, everybody. It's really great to see all of you. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here. It's exciting to see the new members of the council. Uh, I, I always start these remarks, and it's very genuine, uh, with a, a, a statement of appreciation. Uh, we at the board and, and everybody at the GASB really values your time. Uh, you've, you've got J jobs, you've got plenty to do, you don't have to spend time with us, yet you have been willing to invest your time in reading all the papers that we send you beforehand and coordinating input from your organizations and traveling to the meeting and sitting with us for a day and a half and providing that feedback. It's really valuable input to the board. You will routinely, as you listen to board meetings after these meetings, hear us reference the comments that the Gas Act makes. So it's, it's very worthwhile what you're doing, but we really appreciate it. We know that you're volunteering your time. So thank you for being here with us. Uh, my report today uh, in your materials covers the fourth quarter of 2023 because it's still pretty soon after the first quarter that we don't have the first quarter report ending. But in my comments, I'll probably update you not just on the fourth quarter, but things that have happened since the end of the fourth quarter. In December, we did issue statement 102 on certain risk disclosures. We're excited about this standard, appreciate all the council's input along the way as we developed that standard, but we're excited for users of financial information to have now new information about heightened risks and vulnerabilities governments may face related to concentrations and constraints. On our two bigger comprehensive projects, the first one, revenue and expense recognition, 
uh, continues to progress. I think in the last six months or so, we've made a lot of great progress on category B transactions, in particular grant transactions, which can be very tricky. You won't receive an update on that project at this council meeting, but I'm sure you will at the next one. Uh, the second of our comprehensive projects, the financial reporting model project is coming to a conclusion, we expect. As you can see from the draft standard being in your materials, we look forward to receiving your input later today or tomorrow, whichever day we're looking at this one later today, because Roberta's sitting there. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are scheduled to maybe vote, and I mean, hopefully this will be statement 103 later this week at the board meeting following the gas act meeting. But again, we look forward to your comments. Our other projects all do continue to move forward. You will hear about each of them and have an opportunity to provide input during this meeting. One of the other major things we're working on that isn't a technical accounting standard setting project is our financial statement taxonomy. We've talked about that with you at this group. It's kind of our uh, a piece of, really a biggest piece at this point, of our monitoring of electronic financial reporting and how technology is changing the way governments prepare audit and then users consume government financial information. We believe the taxonomy is important for us to work on to help facilitate this continued evolution of technology and how government financial information is ingested into users' processes and making that easier. So um, it, we have devoted more resources to that. We did earlier this year hire a taxonomy specialist to add to that team. While it is a big project and will take some time, we're actually making very quick progress on it. Uh, we are updating continually the, the board. I won't say continually, but uh, routinely we update the board on progress on that. And I would imagine at some point we will begin updating uh, externally, getting external input, including comments from you guys as council members on that project as well. But we are still early stages, even though I did say we are making good progress, we are, but it's it's a big undertaking. Um, this standard, the financial statement taxonomy, whatever it is, in our view, would be a voluntary data standard, for lack of a better term. Uh, whether or not it becomes required for anybody would probably be in the hands of the SEC uh, as they figure out how to implement the Financial Data Transparency Act um, for the municipal market and those who file with the MSRB. So we are certainly in communication about the work on our taxonomy with the SEC. They are listening to us. They're receiving updates. They're asking questions. We don't know what they will do ultimately with it, but um, those two, the implementation of FDTA, whatever that looks like, and our financial statement taxonomy can be potentially similar undertakings, uh, and we hope to be useful to the SEC as they continue their work. Um, when you look at our technical agenda, the only real change since we last talked with you guys was Statement 102 coming off because we issued it. And then the only thing we added was what we're calling an other research activity on gap utilization. Uh, it's an other research activity because it's not going to in any way result in a potential technical project. It's just us studying how many governments use gap. Um, the last time we did that was 2008, uh, and we think that it would be important information for the board, among others, to understand the environment that we're operating in and how many governments and what types of governments utilize GAAP in, as their accounting um, standard as they prepare financial reports. Um, and we hope to, as part of that project, develop a predictive indicator that will allow us to more routinely say every two years, update that um, number so that we can see any trends of, are there increasing numbers of governments using GAP or decreasing numbers of governments using GAP, et cetera. So that is part of that project. Too. So there won't be so long that we kind of evaluate that number and see how it's moving. Uh, with that, I will conclude my report, but I am happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Joel. Any questions for Chairman Black? Seeing none, uh, looks like we're uh, turning it now over to Brian to introduce us to the um, financial reporting model and some gas -like member feedback for that. Okay, so as 
as Joel mentioned, we're almost there. Um, this is a project that began about the time that I started on the GASB. I go back to I go back to mid twenty five. I'm not sure exactly exactly the start point, but the project has been all about trying to make improvements to the existing financial uh, reporting model. So, just a, a little bit of a trip down memory lane. We had an ITC back in December of of uh, 2016, and then a preliminary views in September of 2018, and then an ED in June of 2020. Things got a bit simpler. Uh, when we remove governmental funds from the uh, the current project. Um, so the last time you met, you taught, we asked you for feedback back about the effective date and transition provisions for the proposal. Now, th for this meeting, um, we have shown you a post-pre-ballot draft of the standards uh, and basis for conclusion, and we are looking for your feedback. So with that, I'll turn it over to Roberta and uh, Lisa. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um Actually, the starting date of this of the staff's involvement with this particular issue um, was August 2013. So um, that's it's been quite a long road. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have, as the board has made tentative decisions about the various issues that are included in the project we have brought those to you uh, on a periodic basis so i think we've received a lot of feedback about the um the the issues that are being addressed in this draft um so this is really kind of your this is your final shot at things we, we don't have any uh, understanding that there are board members that have difficulties with what's in the document um, so that we really are very much expecting the board to vote it out on Wednesday and, and become stable at 103. Um, I don't think we have, um, at least board members haven't raised any issues that would be deal breakers at this point. So um, what I propose to do is to kind of treat it the same way we do at the board table. So we, we always skip the summary because you it's hard to talk about the summary without delving into the issues. So it's really easier just to walk through the standards. I'm, I'm gonna walk you through the standards sections and give you an opportunity to provide feedback on each of the topics. And then uh, we'll walk through the basis for conclusions perhaps a little more rapidly um, to see if there's you have comments in those particular areas. Um, and we can come back to the summary if necessary. Um, as you know, we have a, um, a whole process for producing a final standard. And Brian was very correct in that this is a post pre-ballot, not exactly the same as the ballot draft because we did another review, uh, the, the timing of when we need to provide information to GASIC members to allow us to have this secondary review. So, you know, truly editorial things are, we have a process for catching all of those things and there will be some additional review. So it isn't necessary to raise items of that nature, just more on the on the issues that are being presented. So I'm just going to walk through and give you an opportunity to um, provide feedback, knowing that the board has an opportunity to talk about this in two days time. So with that, let's start on, um, oh, you also didn't get paragraph three with the codification instructions, the all, oh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, first, let's go with um, maybe the paragraph two area, the items that are in the scope. Is there anyone that has any um, feedback on the particular issues that are included in the document? So uh, if you do have feedback, uh, what I would ask, if you could turn your little tent of your name up, and then we'll call on you as the, as, the, as we go around the room. But uh, in the meantime, is there any feedback for Roberta on that section two? I don't see any. All right, back to you, Roberta. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna take them by issue. So the, the next one is actually one of the meatier parts of the document is the management's discussion and analysis. And just to remind you of the approach we took with this, which is a little bit different than the other sections is instead of presenting just the changes from what the existing guidance is related to management's discussion and analysis, it's really, it's the whole the whole guidance of, of the, with, with the idea that um, stakeholders, when they pick this up to apply it, will be thinking about it as more of a new thing. Take a fresh approach to how you prepare your MDNA is what we're looking for. So it has in paragraphs um, four through seven are, I guess they're to me they're kind of set up 
for what the requirements are, uh, the specific requirements for mDNA, a little bit of, of you know, the, the, the focus for what type of user is, it's, it's the broad swath of users, not necessarily only those that are sophisticated users, um, the idea of avoiding unnecessary duplication, um, items like that. And then eight is as the detailed requirements. And it has those five major components, the overview of the financial statements, the financial summary, condensed information from the basic financial statements, and the detailed analyses. Uh, and, and we've worked really hard on the language in that area to try to um, convey more specifically the level of detail that we're expecting to see. Um, with that, the idea that that we have gotten feedback that the the level. Um, the depth of the analysis of many of the um, entities that are currently providing mDNA is is not doesn't get down to the crux of, of why things changed. You just talk about what changed rather than getting in, into the understanding of the why. So hopefully um, that would be a little clearer. Um, the fourth section is significant capital asset and long-term financing activity. And then the last section is currently known facts, decisions or conditions we always had this section, but it was it was um, it was a it wasn't very specific as to what types of items. If you recall, when we did our research, we found that the types of things that entities are currently including in this section is a broad array, array of things that may or may not be what was originally intended for them to include. Um, so we have specifics of the uh, types of information that is expected to be brought forward in this area. Um, but that's the um, trends in relevant economic and demographic data uh, information that it's incorporated in the subsequent year's budget that is relevant to this discussion. Um, and then actions the government may have taken um, that affect um, liabilities and assets and things of that nature in the future, as well as um, actions that other parties may have taken that may affect the government in a subsequent period. So with that, um, I, um, I would be happy to hear your feedback and board members would um, be happy to hear feedback on anything in those particular paragraphs of the uh, management's discussion and analysis standards. Um, let's see, we will start with um, Michelle. All right, take this in the vein of if I could ma wave my magic wand. <laughs> so this is, uh, Roberta, related to paragraph five. And my just my only thought here is what we saw when GASB 34 first came out, and we continue to see this, is a lack of understanding of what happens in the MDNA when you have comparative financial statements. We all know, I think, that there's three years worth of information that's required. And that's in a uh, Q&A, right, in the, the standards currently. I would love to see that incorporated here because I feel like we're going to have the same conversations all over again when this comes out. Because, again, it's just when I read the first sentence, particularly of paragraph five, it's just not clear, as clear as I think it, I'd like it to be anyways in that regard. All right. Scott, and then we'll move on to Bob Scott. Yeah, Scott Devaney with AGA. Um, uh, yeah, we we love the the pre or the post pre whatever it is ballot draft. <laughs> this is our only comment is on paragraph eight footnote two, um, which defines currently known. Um, and I'm I'm not sure what the conventions are uh, for what gets to be a footnote or what what isn't. Um, but but our we would really prefer that definitions for key terms uh, be part of the standard rather than a footnote. Um, and then uh, the second thing uh, about that is uh, given the board's tentative decision on subsequent events, which preview of coming attraction, love it, uh, to go with date financial statements are available to be issued. Uh, we'd love for this definition to be harmonized. Um, it may be maybe too preemptive right now to, to change the standard immediately, but uh, just wanted to get that comment in. Uh, we know that Gatsby is very 
uh, tight with their scopes. But um, if if subsequent events uh, does change that date, there's there's six places, uh, and this will be one of them, uh, where we have kind of the old definition, and just would really, really, really appreciate that if. Um, that uh, that excellent idea goes forward that um, within the scope of subsequent events, it could be changed uh, everywhere all at once. Thank you. Uh, Bob, and then we'll go to Matt Harvey. Overall, I think these changes are great. I think MDNA is clearly one of those things that never really lived up to its potential. I think one of the things in hindsight and Gasby was trying to be helpful by giving the example, but by giving just one example, my word, you could look at a hundred actors in the MDNA and every one of them started off with highlights because that's what was in the Gasby example. And then followed the format. There were three points, you know, below the hot. So they just, so, Paul, so what are you doing to try to get beyond that? This is not a strict template, but is actually you have to think about what's needed to be said, because that that to me has been one of the things. In fact, I would tease, tease Dave Bean of, you know, Dave, MDNA is supposed to be totally objective. It shouldn't be highlights. It shouldn't be lowlights. It should just be facts. And he would kind of look at me and get this pain to express. And so I just changed it to in brief. And I tried to, you know, mix up the discussion a little bit and and tried to avoid the what I've heard some people refer to as yo-yo analysis. This went up, this went down and talk about <clears throat> why. But Again, I think that example or some guidance to preparers is going to be really important in terms of how they interpret what you are really looking for, because that's probably the first place they'll go when they start to draft the new requirements for MDNA. Thank you, Bob. Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. So I am... Uh, Overall, extremely supportive of, of the language that we kind of find here in particular. Um, paragraph five around MDNA, you know, again, specifying or asking the MDNA to explain why balances changed or why things change. And related to that, um, kind of in the specific and the detail analysis under what's that, paragraph eight. Subsection C, um, in, including discussion of, you know, policy changes such as tax rates or fees. Uh, that's information that you often don't see in MDNA right now. So I'm, I'm eagerly looking forward to, you know, the financial year, the fiscal year after these come out, seeing these changes implemented, because I think it will be a tremendous, tremendous improvement over what we have right now. Uh, the only uh, point that I had a little bit of an issue with, and I remember this did come up uh, a couple meetings before, a year or two before, and that's uh, around paragraph seven, um, and the focus on the primary government and leaving it up to professional judgment as to whether or not significant in, or the significance of individual component units should be discussed. And I would just bring up again the issue of uh, many Tennessee counties have school districts that are discreetly presented component units. Uh, those school districts are often where they want to look at their assets, where they want to look at revenues or expenses, often as large, if not larger than the primary government. Uh, and yet we often see examples of uh, Tennessee County, MDNA for Tennessee counties, where they either uh, leave out any discussion of the component unit school district uh, or the component unit school, school boards, or flatly state we're leaving discussion of this component unit school board out of, of this discussion. Um, and so I, it would be nice. That word significance is the only thing that bothers me here a little bit here. I, I wish that we could kind of put a little bit more, a little bit of a finer point on what constitutes a significant component unit. Um, because again, to me, it, it's significant if you are you know, as large or larger than the primary government. And I would hope that there would be, I, it would be nice if there would be some stronger language to kind of clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Other discussions on this? Uh, so for me, um, I will just say uh, I, too, was supportive of if it's possible for that footnote two to be available to be issued, if that's at all. I like the idea of a harmonization with a subsequent events project. 
Um, the other thing that came up is um, paragraph eight, what, sub B, sub three around total liabilities, distinguish, distinguishing between long-term liabilities and other liabilities. Um, I, unless I, I, I miss this, I wasn't sure, should long-term liabilities, should that be just the non-current portion or should it be the current plus the non-current that constitutes what a long-term liability is? And then, because the reason I'm asking, I guess I don't know then what other is. If, if other is just current, or is it the current less the current portion of non-current liabilities? I think we've interpreted that in the past to be not to be our current liabilities, but I don't know if that's the intent. Um, so, um, and then I, uh, I for one, and as from NASAC's perspective, I know we've shared this in our group before. We love the examples. I mean, I absolutely hear what Bob's saying around that kind of the examples kind of become the template that everyone uses. Uh, and uh, I understand that uh, that is a definite concern. So I, I, I absolutely hear that. Um, I just would hate to lose the examples because we have found those to be so helpful when we're applying the standard. So that information just becomes extremely helpful for us. And uh, from a component unit standpoint, um, uh, from, a, from a state perspective, um, we have major component units that we identify uh, certainly within our basic financial statements, but it would be a challenge for us to be able to include it within their activity within our, um, uh, our MDNA, because I think it's, they're, they're so independent of us. We really don't have any visibility outside of, of uh, what's in their statements or trying to connect with people. And, and that's been a real challenge. And I think it would affect the timeliness of our statements. Um, so just some, some food for thought there, but I absolutely hear you with, with some of the other ones when they're so large that, that understandable. Yeah, Bob. I absolutely love the examples too. I'm just saying, do some creative things to keep people from blindly following the example. Give more than one example. Maybe break the examples into sections where you have three different examples for each section, and then you look at the one that fits you the most. But you're not just saying, oh, they told me exactly what MDNA should look like. I am just going to substitute sample government for the name of my government, and then I'm going to move forward. Yeah, Alan? Just a quick follow-up, and I appreciate that. And this is a follow-up what you were just talking about, what Scott mentioned a minute ago. This issue date versus available issue date is a little bit of a just a due process question for us. If you think about when it first came up, it first came up in 102, and we talked about going from issue date to available issue date, but yet the exposure draft didn't talk about available issue as a concept. It talked about issue date. And then we got here, we said, well, we probably would want to make this the same thing. But again, the ED for this had already been out. Would this be an issue date? And so the logic was, is when we get to subsequent events, that's the ability for us to, to, to put out there a change from issue date to available issue date. The board's already made a decision that that date would be available issue date within subsequent events. And then I would suspect that if that goes out for due process and people give us feedback on that and people are supportive of change going from issue to available issue, that there'd be a follow-up conversation very likely about, well, what do we do with 102 and what do we do with 103? But it's really about a, a due process and making sure that that switch had never been exposed. And so thinking that we needed to expose that first before we made that change. And so it's, it's more of a timing thing, I think, than anything else. Thank you for that, Alan. All right, back to you, Roberta. Okay, and I will uh, mention, um, thank you, Bob, for suggesting um, additional examples because we're, now I'm filtering in, well, is there anything we want to put in implementation guidance? And you know that after Statement 34, there was one comprehensive illustration which wasn't included in your documents but will be in a final statement, but there's also the ability to provide additional, you're right, and we only ever provided one example of management discussion and analysis, so it's something to consider for the next step. Okay, the next section is unusual or infrequent items, paragraphs nine and 10. Um, what's different about unusual and frequent items is that it's replacing the current guidance to separately present special and extraordinary items. Um, e extraordinary items were those that were both unusual and infrequent. Special items are those that were one or the other and within the control of management. Um, this guidance is attempting to just loosen that a little bit to as far as the number of things that might appear on the face of the statements so that 
um, items that are either unusual or infrequent should be presented separately. They don't have to meet both and they don't have to be within management's control. Um, we'd added some additional guidance about um, separately reporting inflows from an item versus the outflows from an item. So something that nets to a small amount, you might still see something going in and out. So with that, any um, feedback on the unusual or infrequent guidance? Any feedback for Roberta? Seeing none, back to you. Okay, the next section is a presentation of proprietary fund statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position. What's different about this is, um, well, first of all, there is an additional subtotal to be um, presented in the statements. We've always had a separation between operating revenues and expenses and non-operating revenues and expenses. Now there's an additional middle line, which is non-capital subsidies being detailed and a subtotal for operating income loss and non-capital subsidies. Then the other uh, aspects of this, instead of a government being able to set a policy for what is considered operating revenues and expenses and non-operating revenues and expenses, we have specific definition for um, non-operating revenues and expenses or um, description of non-operating revenues and expenses and for operating revenues and expenses would be everything that doesn't fall into the non-operating bucket. Um, this non-operating bucket included um, subsidies, um, includes contributions to permanent term endowments. That's something that wasn't in the exposure draft. We got feedback that that was a piece that was missing from that. Um, Revenues expenses related to financing, resources from the disposal of capital assets and inventory, and investment income and expenses. Um, so one of the items in there I said was subsidies. Um, that's a term we've used in the GASB literature, but we don't, our literature does not have a specific definition for subsidies. So now we, we that is included in this guidance. Um, we've kind of worked on the language for this quite a bit <laughs> since, uh, since we first um, moved it out with the I, acknowledging the idea that subsidies can be both subsidies can be provided through a proprietary fund or our proprietary fund can receive subsidies as part of of uh, its um how how it um how, how everything works out for that organization so um and um in the definition of subsidies we made it clear there were questions about transfers where they fit in the scheme of things and we wanted to make it clear that transfers are subsidies. So we made sure it was included in that definition. So with that, any feedback about the proprietary fund guidance being provided? Anything to share with Roberta? Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I am a big fan of, of the presentation. Um, I'm a big fan of the definition of subsidies. I, I understand that this was a, a difficult and at times Touchy subject, um, but I, I am. Uh, I, I think this is a good definition of subsidies. I think this will be. Uh, I can think of several examples. I won't name specific names, uh, but of certain water and sewer systems where there are these transactions that definitely meet the definition of a subsidy that were not called such, uh, and that I think that this will be this will be help, very helpful uh, in certain specific circumstances that I can think of. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Darren? Uh, yeah, generally supportive of the change in the presentation uh, guidance here. I uh, appreciate the consistency and comparability uh, improvements from a policy-based approach to a uh, defined approach. Uh, I do anticipate, um, and there have questions have come up as we share this in the healthcare environment, um, uh, business type activities and follow the proprietary funds. Um, some of these third party payer arrangements and the questions of what is a subsidy and is this change, is this gonna change anything? I think there's some questions about how much that question really rolls into the revenue and expense recognition project versus the presentation guidelines. But just, I anticipate you probably will get some technical inquiries if this does pass in the current form and uh, might be something that lands on your uh, Q and A uh, impl implementation guidance project. So, but otherwise supportive. Thank you, Darren. Um, Joni? Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. Great job. And we sometimes feel like we're different because we follow FERC and this is this will all work. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. 
Darren, you've already shared. All right, back to you, Roberta. Okay, yes. Um, you did note that um, th this area of subsidies is ripe for implementation guidance. Um, we are um, thinking about things like that. Um, in the feedback from the exposure draft, we had lots of questions about this particular example, would it be, would it fall within our definition of subsidies or not? And um, so you may see some things of that nature in a, a future implementation guide exposure. Um, let's see, the next section is information about major component units in basic financial statements. The, the goal in this guidance here was to reduce the alternatives that a government has for presenting major component unit information. The existing guidance allows three different ways of presenting that information, with one of them being notes to financial statements. And with our conceptual framework that includes communication methods, we have this idea that there is one right home for things. Um, so something that could be either in notes or in basic statements doesn't, um, doesn't fit with that very well. So that's what this is trying to do, is to provide um, that this information should be in basic financial statements. If, if it's a relatively small number of major component units um, and it's feasible to put it on the face of the statements, that's where it should be. And if that makes too confusing presentation, then the major component unit information should be presented in um, combining statements um, after the um, fund financial statements. So any feedback on the information about major component units? Any feedback for Roberta? Seeing none, back to you, Roberta. Okay, the next section is on budgetary comparison information. In the theme of we have, um, we have additional conceptual framework guidance now than we did when statement 34 was issued. Um, the idea that there would be a home, you know, a single home for a particular type of information is, is part of what this is. Budgetary comparison information um, could, um, from the guidance in statement 34, could be presented as required supplementary information or as a basic financial statement. The board evaluated using its framework and decided that the only place it should be is required supplementary information. And um, they also identified specific variances that should be presented as part of budgetary comparison information. That would be the original to final budget amounts and the final budget to actual should be presented. Um, and it should uh, the explanation of significant variations in those items sh should be presented as, as part of um, the required supplementary information as well. So um, any comments on budgetary comparison information? Bob? I have made these comments in past meetings, so I won't belabor them too much. I have no problem with the formatting changes. I think those are appropriate changes. I take great exception to... Uh, removing the option for uh, putting in the basic financial statements. Um, the art of financial management and local government is all about trust and building trust among your elected officials. Uh, often the terms for elected officials are two to three years. They turn over quite a bit. And I recently changed jobs. After 31 years, I went to a rapidly growing city where, quite honestly, the council did not trust anything staff gave them. And so I've been working very hard to establish that trust. And one of the things I did to do that was the first uh, act for we issued, I told the council, I'm moving the budget from RSI over to the basic financial statements. And the reason I am is because now the budget will be audited. And I, I, I said, you know, I've worked with councils long enough to know you have no idea what is in the statement of net position. You don't know what my total revenues per the statement of activities was, but you know what my general fund budget is. And why wouldn't I want you to have that general fund budget with some independent audit assurance so that you know what I am telling you is accurate and fairly stated. 
And I made, you know, I've said this before, but it made a difference with my counsel when they saw I wasn't just trying to feed things to them, but I wanted them to independently verify what I was telling them. So I'm actually contemplating once the standard takes effect of talking to my auditors and seeing if there would be some type of supplementary schedules or audit audit opinion based on my budget so that council can continue to have that assurance. Uh, I'm sure it'll cost more. What I've my experience in the past has been when it was an option was, okay, guys, I wanted his basic financial statement. Sure. And there were ne there was never any additional cost. If it's a separate opinion, I'm sure there will be. But to me, this is uh, something I feel doesn't look at the elected officials, the legislative stakeholders and and give them what they need. Thank you, Bob. Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. So I was listening to Bob and that he made some really good points that I had not considered before. Uh, so having some budgetary information kind of move to the financial statements that if it's there, it's audited. That's that's a great point that I hadn't thought of before. So thank you for that. Um, I, I would just add that um, I can't argue with the board's logic in terms of how it came to the conclusions of including of, of why it's suggesting that budgetary information should be moved to RSI. So I can't really fault the logic on its own terms. Uh, I would say that you're probably going to have a lot of confused emails and phone calls when this goes into effect of people saying, where did my budgetary information go? Um, so it, it's still there. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying this is going to surprise a lot of people when they open up, uh, what is that going to be fiscal year 2026 and, and they don't find their budgetary information where they're expecting it to be. So that's, that's the only point that I would make there. David. Yeah, I concur with Bob. Um, it's advantageous to um, allow the flexibility for cities to either put it in the RSI or keep it with their financial statements. I believe it would provide um, it would provide that flexibility and also provide that transparency that um, some councils might want. You know, not all councils, a lot of councils probably don't even look at the uh, look at the financials in detail, but some do. And providing that flexibility, I think, would be would be an advantage. Yeah, Scott Devaney with AGA. Just to, I mean, we support uh, we support the uh, the draft as it is. Um, I think um, you know flexibility is good, but uh, standardization is also really really important. Um, so uh, it's just like a lean Six Sigma principle, right? The more variation you got, the the more that people have to look in multiple places to see where it's at. And if it could just be in one spot for everyone forever that would be fantastic um and yeah uh to your to, to bob's point um you know you can always ask the auditor to just uh give you another opinion on that which is totally possible and we do that thank you thank you scott other feedback seeing none back to you roberta Okay, paragraph 17 on financial trend information in the statistical section, that is, it's carrying forward some of the changes to the um, presentation of the proprietary fund statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position, carrying it through to the information that's presented in the statistical section. So um, I'm not going to ask a specific question. I presume it's, it's just a follow on for that, but um, and then the final section in the standard section is the effective date and transition. Uh, this has changed quite a bit from the exposure draft in that uh, we do we have a single implementation date because the scope of the, the standards have been reduced. Um, this is the date that was proposed for the smaller governments, so it's the furthest out date that, that was proposed in the exposure draft. Um, and now that we have statement 100 on accounting changes and error corrections, there's a standards way, unless there's something different about the particular standards being implemented, that it's appropriate just to refer to that guidance rather than 
repeat that guidance in every statement. So that, that paragraph has changed quite a bit as well, just to refer to statement 100. So um, any comments on effective date and transition? Lisa? So Anita Kovacs from um, Nakubo could not be with us today at the meeting, but she did take the time to draft up some comments. So I wanted to be sure that I shared these with the group. And this one in particular relates to that paragraph on the effective date and transition. And she's saying that she feels it's going to be a challenge for preparers to implement the timing of this. She really wishes that um, we could give another year so that preparers have more time to learn and implement and adequately prepare um, for the standard change. So she's looking for another year above and beyond um, what was presented here in the pre-draft ballot. Lisa, did she ask, say anything about specifically what was going to be challenged to implement? She did not, Brian. Any other feedback for Roberto or Michael? Thanks, um, Michael Weinstein uh, from the bond insurance community. Um, I would just say in general, um, single implementation dates um, are something that I favor um, because when there are different uh, applications to different governments, that creates a lot of problems for users like us who go through hundreds, if not thousands of uh, uh, ACFRs per year. Um, and just based on systems and you know databases, uh, different implementation dates are very uh, problematic. So. I welcome that. Thank you, Michael. I see no other feedback, Roberta. Okay, um, I'll I'll step through the the rest of the document briefly, give you an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, Appendix A is kind of like our history of the project, so you can see it starts with a pretty um, early date and. Um, goes through all the steps. And I would point out that one of the steps in A14 is we talk about the um, feedback and discussions we've had with the gas sec. Um, any comments on Appendix A? Uh, I don't see any. OK, um, the basis for conclusion sections, um, a big chunk of it. Um, is management's discussion and analysis. Uh, we've gone through and tried to explain all of the nuances of the changes that we've made from um, the existing literature as well as um, the changes from the exposure draft. So that goes through um, like paragraph B34. So any comments in this section? I don't see anything. Back to you. Okay. Um, a rationale for the guidance on unusual or infrequent items is in B35 to B38. Any feedback there? I don't see any. Back to you. Okay. Um, proprietary fund, um, statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position. Uh, that discussion is B39 through B44. Any feedback in that area? We're a quiet bunch, apparently, on this okay, right now. Okay, okay. Um, major component unit information, B45 to B47. I'm not seeing any feedback. Okay. Um, budgetary comparison discussion, uh, B48 through B56. Oh, Joni. Joni Davis, American mm -hmm. Public Power Association. One of the comments were being raised about why we are doing the budget mm -hmm. as we're doing it and not in the financial statements. I found this information very helpful. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. Uh, any other comments for Roberta on this? All right, back to you, Roberta. Okay, the next section is um, potential improvements considered but not required. So there were other issues that were raised during the course of the project that the board talked about and considered and did not end up having um, standards on, which included um, additional information about debt service funds in the basic financial statements, um, a schedule of government-wide expenses by natural classification, statement of cash flows, 
and then uh, a larger section on governmental funds. So any feedback on the, the issues discussed, but for which no final standards are issued? Any feedback for this? Um, I could just say for me, um, as a preparer, I was very glad to see no statement of cash flows. I think that would have lost half of my staff. So yeah. kudos on, on that one. Okay, but you know, we did consider it because we did have feedback that, that information has value for some people. So, Okay, the next section is on small government considerations. Um, with this being, you know, the, the board is sensitive to the idea that not all governments have the same resources and um, frequently GASAC members are providing us information about the potential challenges there are out there for um, actually probably even large governments these days as far as having the resources to implement things. So, uh, but we did specifically take a look at um, whether there was any consideration for any changes we might do for certain for smaller governments. So that there's our discussion. There's a uh, paragraphs B66 through B72 is, is that discussion, that consideration. Any feedback on this section for small governments? <laughs> I don't see any back, back to you, Roberta. Okay, and then the next section is considerations related to benefits and costs. Um, as you know, that is a regular um, process for the board to consider once we get to the point where we, we know what guidance the board is, is wants to issue is to consider both the costs and the benefits <laughs> and determine whether it's appropriate to proceed with that. So this discussion goes into that. It talks about the, um, the benefits specifically of the types of information that these standards would bring forward and then all of the information the board has about the costs, which it primarily we, we did a field test at some point through the the process of the project. So that's it's our discussion, as well as our overall conclusion as to whether the um, the benefits outweigh the costs. So any questions or any uh, feedback on B73 to B81? Any feedback for Roberta? Not seeing anything back to you. Okay, the last piece in the basis is effective date in transition, our discussion for the transition from having the two tiered implementation down to a single implementation date. Um, any comments on B82 to 84? Any feedback? I don't see any. Okay, and then I will step back to the summary. Um, we've, I think we've gone through all of the issues. Um, we always do this with the board. If there's anything specific they felt should be included in the summary or said in a different way, we're open to that as well. So um, do we have any feedback on the summary? The first few pages, first three pages. Any feedback on this? I do not see any of that either. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the feedback throughout the years. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta. I know this was a, a, as you mentioned, since 2013, it's been a long project. So thank you for all your work on that and Lisa as well. So um, yeah, thank you for, all right, uh, looks like we are a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but next I have, uh, looks like uh, Carolyn Smith, it will introduce us to um, feedback on classification of non-financial assets. Carolyn. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Non-financial asset classifications and exposure draft was released in September of 2023 and comment period closed in January. Uh, we received 27 comments uh, either through letters or through our online uh, survey form. Um, so today, Deborah and her team will seek your input on uh, the board tentative decisions that were made at our March meeting um, this issue is also on the agenda for this week, so it's really important that we get your feedback on the items that we're going to be discussing at this week's meeting. Um, if all goes according to plan, a final statement will be um, possibly issued in July of this year with implementation for FY 2025. Um, let me make sure I had the date. Implementation for fiscal years beginning after June 15th, 2025, and early application is always encouraged. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Deborah. Thank you, Carolyn. 
Uh, as Carolyn mentioned, we are in the redeliberation phase of this project. Uh, so we look to get your feedback today on some of the tentative decisions that the board has already made in that process and then get your feedback in advance of some topics that we'll talk about later this week. So first we have some of the things that the board has already discussed and those primarily relate to what was paragraph four in the exposure draft, which gave a list of certain types of capital assets that should be disclosed separately within what we call the capital assets roll forward note. The note disclosure required by statement 34, that's beginning balances, additions, dispositions, and ending balances. In considering the feedback that was received on paragraph four, um, the board has tentatively decided to carry forward uh, three of these items that lease assets reported under statement 87, subscription assets from statement 96, and intangible assets uh, other than lease and subscription assets by major class of asset. Those three items, the board has tentatively decided to uh, carry those proposed requirements forward to the final statement. In addition, uh, the board has tentatively decided to add uh, certain intangible assets recognized under Statement 94, and those would be right-to-use assets that a governmental operator in a P3 arrangement uh, might be recognizing in accordance with that statement. Uh, because we talk a lot about 87, 94, and 96 as uh, companions almost, uh, as they were built on the same type of model, um, the board thought that they should add the Statement 94 assets uh, to be disclosed separately as well as the other two. The other potential change that the board has tentatively decided relates to paragraph 4B from the exposure draft, um, which some of you may remember there was a, a fair amount of discussion on um, prior to the exposure draft going out. We as expected, got a lot of feedback uh, about what that was about and concern about uh, understandability of that language. Uh, to help with that, the board has tentatively decided to broaden um, the idea. 4B was focused on intangible assets that are the right to use intangible underlying assets. Um, but they have tentatively decided that the principles of that, it really doesn't matter if the underlying asset is an intangible or a tangible asset. Uh, and so the tentative decision is that all types of right to use assets, other than the ones that have been specifically called out, uh, would be not reported together with the owned version of that same type of asset. Uh, the specific wording is still in process, so we don't have that for you today, um, but we wanted your feedback on the general idea. And so I'll start by asking the first uh, discussion question, which is, do you agree or disagree with the board's tentative decision to separately disclose lease and subscription assets and why? Feedback for Deborah. Okay. Um, Lisa's got one for Anita. So Anita Kovacs from the Kubo. Um, I agree. Leases are generally for physical assets and speed is for intangibles. It's good to know what the individual amounts are rather than have them grouped together. So I agree. Any other feedback? Seeing none. Back to you, Deborah. So question two is, do you agree or disagree with the board's tentative decision to separately disclose intangible right to use assets recognized by governmental operators in a public-public partnership and why? Scott? Uh, Scott Davini from AGA. I'll just answer uh, questions one through three. We agree. Uh, and in particular um, on this one, um, you know, this is going to let the 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 note disclosure match up with uh, with this number there. So um, uh, AGA is all for, uh, to Michael's point, you know, as much standardization as possible. Love it. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, at least Lisa. So again, for Anita Kovacs from Nakubo, um, I agree. Public-public partnerships can expect public scrutiny and information on them should therefore be able to be found and understood so that there's greater transparency. So I agree. Thank you, Lisa. Mr. Chair. Yes. 
I think this is you said it earlier when we started the meeting today, and I appreciated it a lot. And when we went through one of we went through, I was going to call it one of three. <laughs> we went through FRM a minute ago. I think a lot of a lot of folks just responding on comments, which was t actually fine because we're basically saying this is the ballot. Do you have any comments? But here it's a little different, right? Because when we ask the question, do you agree or disagree? Silence doesn't tell us the answer to that question because silence doesn't say whether you agree or disagree, right? Silence doesn't help. Um, so it's important, even if you do agree in the room, to say it. Uh, if you don't agree, that's fine too. But the, 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 the not saying either one doesn't tell us whether you agree or disagree. We're kind of left not knowing. And so it's important for folks, even if you, even if you just want to do what Scott just did, say we agree. That's actually helpful. Um, you don't. You didn't expound on it a lot. You don't have to, but at least we know he agrees. And so it's important as we go through these questions, just at least to tell us that you agree or disagree. It doesn't have to be more than I agree, but that's helpful to us. Thank you, Alan. Uh, maybe we'll do a quick reset in questions one and two. Uh, Michelle? Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Um, yes, overwhelmingly, we agreed with one, two, and three, actually. Thank you, Michelle. Lisa? <laughs> I agree with one, two, and three. I said, yeah, I wrote on my notes that they all seem good to me. Uh, Harriet? Yes, I had it that I agreed with one, two, and three also, and specifically on one, my reasons are similar to Anita's in that they're very different from each other and that one is physical and the other is not. Sophia? Uh, also want to state for the record that I agree with uh, one, two, and three. Makes sense to users to separate it and uh, doesn't seem to be a stronger counter argument. So supportive of those. Thank you. I'll say for me, uh, Rob Hamilton, NASAC, uh, we are also we're supportive of the, of the first three. So let me jump on the band for Anita because I only gave her answers for one and two. Let me also tell you that she agreed with three. Um, and she said that Lisa's speeders and P3s of various sorts are large amounts and they should be presented and discussed separately in the statements for clarity and greater transparency. Thank you, Lisa. Any other thoughts on one, two, or three, since we've kind of included all those? Oh, I know, Deborah, you haven't asked three specifically yet. All right, back to you, Deborah. All right, so I'll move on to question four then, which is, do you agree or disagree with the board's tentative decision to require that all types of right to use assets not be reported in the same major class as owned capital assets and why? All right, thoughts on this? And just a quick reminder, um, if you do, uh, if you would add your name and organization before you share your comments too, it'll be helpful for the recording, Michelle. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Yeah, we absolutely agree with this one. 4B was a paragraph that we had difficulty with before. So we think that the clarifications that you're making make a lot of sense. Um, it's easy to understand and we agree with the presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Scott? Yeah, Scott uh, with AGA. Uh, yeah, we we agree. Uh, really appreciate the board's uh, work on this and uh, you know respect that you were trying to kind of stay within certain parameters before, but this totally makes sense. And um, thanks for continuing to work on that wording. Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors, uh, agreed wholeheartedly uh, with a decision to, to talk about them separately. They're just, they're fundamental, fundamentally different things. So uh, agree. Uh, Stephen? I'm Stephen Stewart, Governmental Research Association. Uh, we we agree with one through four. Uh, on four, like the others, uh, we appreciate the greater clarity that this would bring. Um, all of the the ideas here make a lot of sense for the separation of the different types of assets, and uh, we also think it would help facilitate uh, comparisons among governments. That would be helpful. Thank you, Stephen. Joni. Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. I'm a little bit conflicted on this one because, you know, I referenced FERC and the, the uniform system of accounts and there are different processes and they are very important to follow those as you set rates. And this is an area where FERC does not agree with GASB on speedas and leases and how that is being used. And But I do think that separation will help us 
address those differences. So I think that's the best win-win situation we can have. So, Sophia? Sophia Ducar with NGA, uh, agree with uh, number four. Makes sense, thanks. Uh, Lisa? And again, representing Anita Kovacs from Nakubo, they agree. And she believes that physical and intangible assets are very different in nature and the amount should not be commingled without distinguishment. So in agreement with what we're doing here. Uh, um, Beth? <coughs> Elizabeth Thomas, um, National Association of Bond Lawyers. It, I agree with this one. Um, I just would like to say that I, I think this is a very good exercise for governments to go through in having um, clients tell me, oh, yeah, we own that. We can do whatever we want. And then it comes down to they actually don't. They just have the right to use it. And I think that is um, it's a very good exercise for them to have to go through for what um, Anita, Lisa, Slash just said. They are very different and, and what you can and cannot do. So that's a long answer to agree. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so for me, um, I w I'm uh, NASEC uh, representing um, Rob Hamilton from NASEC. Uh, we agree. Uh, the notes that I wrote is they ostensibly at some point may need to be returned. Um, and I think that uh, um, it adds context to the capital asset strategy that the government is taking. And it also provides some sort of comparison to the liability side, which I find valuable. So, any other feedback on this one? Seeing none, back to you, Deborah. Great, thank you. So now we move into the topic of capital assets held for sale. So this was another one of the items that was proposed in uh, paragraph four of the exposure draft to be disclosed separately within the capital assets roll forward. And based on the feedback received uh, to that particular piece, the board considered six different alternatives for moving forward. There were there, People had a lot to say about this one. Um, alternative one was to carry forward the proposal from the exposure draft that capital assets held for sale be uh, a separate item within the capital asset roll forward. Alternative two was to uh, pull it out of the capital asset roll forward and just have a separate disclosure of the ending balances only rather than having the beginning balances and the activity for the year in the roll forward. Alternative three was to have discussion of this in the MDNA rather than in the note disclosures. Alternative four, what, uh, alternatives four and five were to disclose a different piece of information. Uh, alternative four to disclose idle capital assets. Alternative five to disclose proceeds from actual sales. Uh, and alternative six was not to disclose anything related to this topic whatsoever. Uh, that was the cost benefit option. And going through these, the board did tentatively decide on alternative two, which was to disclose the ending balance only. Uh, they believe that based on what we heard from users in our pre-agenda research outreach, that information about capital assets held for sale is essential to those users. Um, and that alternatives four and five uh, being different pieces of information were not acceptable substitutes for it. Uh, they do believe that note disclosures is the appropriate place based on our conceptual framework rather than the MDNA. Uh, and then comparing alternative one, the roll forward alternative two, the ending balances only, uh, the board decided that the main use of this information that they heard from users was about liquidity analysis, uh, which would benefit most from just having the ending balance and so the board decided on alternative two uh, to move to the final statement. And so the quest discussion question five is, do you agree or disagree with the board's tentative decision to require note disclosure of the end of year balances of capital assets held for sale with separate disclosure of historical cost and accumulated depreciation by major class of asset and why? Feedback on this question, Harriet, then Bob. 
Harriet Richardson Association, Local Government Auditors. Yes, I agreed. And I had been writing, the way I went through this was as I read each one, I was writing yes, no, yes, no against them and only had one yes. And it was against number two. Um, and so, um, uh, yes, I definitely agreed with that. And, you know, some of the comments I had on the other ones, um, number four and um, five uh, in particular, um, no, because uh, number four, because help for sale likely means it's going to be liquidated at some point. And even if that sale doesn't go through, you know, at some point later in time, it's going to. And then on number five, um, if it's held for sale, it provides a picture of the future, which is sometimes needed in addition to the current financial um, um situation if you know something's eventually going to be so sold you want to kind of have a sense of that um even if it doesn't complete the sale in that year so those were my reasons thank you harriet bob my only concern with this is governments as a rule not all governments are very very stable and the Government you saw 50 years ago may not look a whole lot different in terms of jurisdictional area, key duties, et cetera. And so for me, capital assets so held for sale in the routine operation of the business, equipment, the fire trucks have a 15-year life. They're going to be sold at the end of the 15 years, et cetera. I'm not sure that provides any more useful information. Now, capital assets held for sale that represent a major change in operation of the business, you're getting out of the wastewater treatment business and you are going to sell the land related to your old wastewater plant because it's now being shipped three jurisdictions down the creek. That is major but hopefully governments will have the common sense to apply some materiality thresholds and won't feel obligated to list out all the equipment held at auction and that type of thing so i it's a qualified i i think there needs to be language to make it clear that it should be for things that are not in the routine nature of operations that literally happen every year. Thank you, Bob. Next, I have um, Matt and then Christine. Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. Uh, so agree um, with the decision on alternative two. Um, you know, you do worry a little bit about some manipulation about this, about, you know, moving assets into and out of that category, but I mean, I, I think, you know, most users such as us, when when we're looking at these entities and we're looking at this, we're not just looking at like one year in isolation, we're looking at historical trends. So even if that's not discussed within the statements, any significant changes will be apparent if you just go back a year, two or three, as we typically do when we're looking at these things. Thank you. Christine, then Ileana. Uh, Christine Brock, ICMA. And... Uh... When I was going through here, the the first one through four, everything was agree, and and it, seemed, it just kind of kind of rocked. But then this one really uh, made me think from the perspective of, of local governments, in, in specifically because um, certainly lo what I see is more of want gov local governments that want to sell land, and 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 actually the the local government that I work for has looked at selling property and actually has put such strings because of the public purposes they want done with the property that the sales are falling through. And it's happening, The and I'll give a couple of examples, workforce housing, uh, the city believes that the public purpose to um, to sell property for workforce housing. However, when the nonprofit comes back and asks for a large amount of money, so it's not really selling the property for gain, it's actually going to cost money. Um, that's one example. They've looked at proposals for a children's museum, wanted to do something in that regards to public purpose, and that fell through. Um, so th this one, and I know that kind of bleeds into question six, but I couldn't think of them entirely separate that um, I think over time, 
the, this capital assets held for sale has looked different for local governments because of uh, specifically with land. If governments own property, old schools that you don't use anymore, um, property that was purchased years ago when it was opportunity to buy it. And now that there's um, memorandums of understanding that have been executed, but the terms just can't be, they're very, very difficult for um, the, either the private sector or a private developer to meet for, for whatever reason. So um, I'm not explaining that very eloquently, but by the, the capital assets held for sale is, I think it's much more difficult in a practical um, and what we do live than probably it ever has been um, as staff because we just, we have boards that really have, they really have a public purpose in mind for these assets and um, they're having a hard time finding partners who can execute those those desires. Thank you. Eliana? Eliana Perez, ICI. I also agree, or we also agree, um, and I especially appreciate Bob's comments on materiality kind of thresholds by end users. Um, I think that where appropriate, uh, the other thing that I agree on is that it be in the notes because it really lends itself to a more in-depth discussion where these things arise and that materiality is there. Um, so you know, agree with that and agree with, you know, having that ending balance available. So uh, Lisa Washburn next and then Joni. Lisa Washburn, NFMA. I agree with option two um, for the reasons that have been stated by Ileana, Matt and others. Um, and I, I hadn't thought about the materiality concept, um, but I, I think that that is something that is a good idea to consider. Uh, Joni and then Scott. Joni Davis, American Public Power Association, and our industry is very capital intensive. And I too wanted to express my appreciation to Bob for bringing up the materiality. And that's what helped us to get through speeders and leases. So thank you. Thank you very much. Scott? Yeah, Scott Devaney with AGA. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, alternative two would be that where the capital assets held for sale would continue to be reported in their original category in the table, like land or whatnot. So that would prevent this bouncing around. Uh, and then there would be a separate additional disclosure on, hey, here's the amounts for, okay, for what's held for sale. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, uh, our group would support alternative two. Um, uh, we're we're okay with alternative one, but but definitely see you know why objections were raised. Um, either of those would result in separate reporting of the capital assets held for sale and create standards to define the condition, which is what we were hoping for. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so for me, Rob Hamilton with NASAC, uh, we were a little bit split in our group. Um, we had some. Uh, the majority were actually in pre uh, preferred alternative one. Uh, personally, I liked alternative two. Um, I kind of felt like it focuses on what matters, just the ending balance, as opposed to the beginning and in the, the changes throughout the year. So I liked, from a preparation standpoint, just being able to focus on what was at the ending. I did like also the ability to, or the element of it that requires the separate reporting of the historical cost and the accumulated depreciation. I thought that was helpful pieces of information to know, um, and it and it. You know, it, for me, it was responsive to the essentiality that was communicated by the users. I, I like the linking of that. And if that um, is what I picked up in the papers, that was uh, an important piece of that. So alternative two was what I was supportive of. And, and uh, I would I would be supportive if, if uh, there was a decision made to uh, add a kind of a, a level of importance to um, whether it's uh, kind of a, a prominency like we have for um, the impairment of capital assets, that's been an important piece for us, I think, when we've looked at whether we have disclosure issues on, on um, the impairments item. But I think as part of this experience in Gas Act, I, I continually remind myself, and as we've kind of worked with other state agencies in, in, in Oregon, is, hey, there's the materiality kind of box that's in the standard. And if it's not material, we can ignore it. And so um, that's been a very helpful piece that's, again, where we've been able to ignore elements that would otherwise have, otherwise, uh, have been included. So I'm um, seeing no other feedback. So back to you, Deborah. All right, thank you. So now we'll move into some of the topics that the board will be discussing later this week. And it starts with uh, looking at paragraph five from the exposure draft, which was the criteria for a capital asset to be classified as held for sale. And there were two pieces to that proposal. One, that the government has decided to sell the asset 
and two, that it is probable that the sale will be finalized within one year of the financial statement date. The first piece of this that we would like to get your feedback on relates to the government has decided to sell the asset. So we had some respondents who requested more guidance in a final statement about what that means, uh, who has to make that decision um, with some suggestions that the guidance say maybe the person with the final level of authority or highest level of authority has decided to sell the asset. Uh, on the one hand, that could bring some more perhaps consistency uh, to people uh, applying the criteria uh, to their situations. Uh, on the other hand, because governments do have perhaps very different uh, policies and procedures for selling capital assets, it may uh, end up that in some cases a government says they have not decided to sell an asset until perhaps too late. Uh, in the sales process. Um, so I would like to ask discussion question number six on this, which is, do you believe that the decision to sell a capital asset must be made by the final or highest level of authority in order to be classified as held for sale and why? All right, Michelle. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Uh, yes, and this was one of the items in our um, comment letter that we wanted that specificity in the, the final standard. So we appreciate your putting that in there. I think this is going to help with the conversation. You know, I can certainly see scenarios where I go out to audit a local government and they say, well, the DPW director made that decision, but if he has no authority to make that decision, it, it just, it makes a lot more sense where you're headed. So appreciate that. Thank you. Harriet. Uh, Harriet Richardson, Association of Local Government Auditors. So um, I actually disagreed with this one because I've worked for a variety of different governments and they all have different approaches and the whoever has that authority isn't always clear. And so if it's, you know, I think you would have to have a clear policy about who has the authority to decide rather than sometimes it being just a general policy that they can put certain assets up for sale up to, you know, a certain value or something like that without having like to go to their board for approval. But but certain ones have to go to their board for approval. So I don't think it is necessarily as clear across the board about it working um, to have it specif specifically be the highest level of authority and who that might be depending on the government agency. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, so, uh, Christine? Uh, Christine Brock, ICMA. And uh, yes, I do I do agree with this decision. I'm off, often when a when there's deliberation about sale of an asset, staff will have a, a different opinion than either the um, the mayor, county mayor, or um, or any individual elected official. But having the clarity of the highest level of authority would um, would I can see how an auditor would appreciate that as well as that wouldn't put staff in the position for a finance director to make that to make that call for what should be in the financial statements. Thank you. Suzanne? Suzanne Lowenson, American Accounting Association. Maybe this is a separate question, but I thought more importantly than who makes the decision was whether there's some evidence of intent to sell the asset, because even if the, the decision is made in a Board of County Commissioners meeting, you know, are there, is there preparation of the asset? Is there appraisal of the asset? Is there a market for the asset? Um, and and maybe that's covered elsewhere, but I that was a question that that um, that came to me. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. So uh, I thought the point that Harriet brought up was a good one in terms of clarification of who exactly that highest authority is. That was something that I hadn't considered, but that kind of got me thinking when. She was talking about that, so I, I think that's a great idea. And uh, yes, wholeheartedly agree that you know, however that highest authority is defined, uh, you know, approval from that you know should be, they should have that before they can say we're holding that. I mean, the way that I was actually thinking about this that that Scott might appreciate. I can tell my friends that I'm going to go to Boston with them to see the Illini in the Sweet Sixteen, uh, but unless my wife tells me that's okay, I'm not actually going. So. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Sophia? 
So I had concluded um, yes on this one, but for the same reasons that Harriet uh, brought up to vote no on it. So um, uh, knowing that there's multiple layers of governments and that they all have different governance structures, I'm thinking of independent authorities down to city governments, local uh, county governments that might have a strong mayor or some that might have a weak mayor or, or even state governments. Uh, when I'm thinking the highest um, level of authority, I'm thinking that it's gone through all of the approvals and either, you know, usually the legislative council or body has uh, signed off on it. And that's what I had assumed reading this. And if, if, it, if the details are clear enough in the weeds to indicate that that's what it is, then I think it makes a lot of sense to, uh, as long as it's got approval by the highest level final uh, decision maker, that then it can, um, you know, be okay to uh, be classified for sale. Otherwise, you, you'll have five lawmakers disagree with one another or whatever. But if there's a, a record, a, a vote, or um, or if it's up to a you know an executive CEO level person and that's clear in statute or uh, then uh, then I think it makes a lot of sense to default to the final decision maker. Thank you, Sophia. Joni. Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. This one was a really difficult one, and then I remembered Bob's Bob's wise words of materiality because some of the things happen, they just are going to that last approval is just more as because the approval is required, but all the activity and work has already been done and the sell has been made. So I, I appreciated what the Gatsby said in their comments, wanting to know it as soon as possible. But some of those are probably smaller in nature. If it's a real big thing, it is going to have to get some more formal approval by the highest level. And especially with utilities, a lot of the monies we get are financed with revenue bonds. So we really have to be very careful about selling any capital assets. So I do like that piece of it. As long as I remembered that materiality piece, I could get through that part about some of the actions wouldn't be known until right when they happen. So thank you. But those would be the immaterial ones. All right. Scott, then Ileana. Yeah, Scott with uh, AGA. Um, so our, our group had a mixed reaction to this one. Um, like Sophia, some people understood it uh, to mean like the highest authority as in the end of the process, like however the government's policy was uh, was going. And then other people understood it to mean Gatsby was going to define what what level of authority got to approve uh, that. And everyone was like, oh no, please don't do that because it is is obviously different throughout, you know, different governments and stuff. Um, but it also kind of created a, a discussion in our group about like, wait, wait, what do we mean by approval? So um, I think it's a good thing to, to discuss because there's approval to pursue uh, a sale. Uh, I think this might be what Christine might would might have been talking about earlier. There's authority to pursue a sale. Like this is now a surplus property. Like let's pursue a sale. And then there's authority to like actually execute at the end, uh, which I think that you don't want to want to uh, base it on that because at that point the sales already happened, uh, and therefore there's it's, the disclosure would be not meaningful. Um, so I, I think the takeaway is a criteria like this can be confusing. So it needs to be really clear. Um, and uh, I, I just encourage um, taking a, a policy approach like with uh, GASB 54 to just reference the, the government's policy and then just to be clear about it's about pursuing. So uh, for example, all approvals needed to pursue sale of asset have been obtained in accordance with the government's policies. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Ileana? Ileana Perez, ICI. I I agree with some of what Scott just said about having just the necessary approvals, um, more so because I, I think about councils or governments where you have maybe more contentious endeavors, especially when it relates to land and potentially economic development projects where you might have, you know, opposing parties wanting to sell, not wanting to sell. Um, so you'll you'll want to know that those approvals are in place because if the if the idea as a user is to then give credit to whatever liquidity or positive implications of that decision. Um, seeing the number on the on the financial statement, then you'd kind of want to know that those approvals were in place and not that, you know, there's still some hurdle to be met uh, at the end. Lisa? 
Lisa Washburn, NFMA. I agree with this. I thought that, um, and from hearing the discussion, maybe uh, maybe I'm not incorrect in my thinking of this. When you say the final or the highest level, I wonder if the or creates some kind of confusion as to what level we're actually talking about. Um, and maybe if it was just the final level and goes back to, as Scott was saying, more reference to policies as to how that final decision gets made. Um, and again, it, it would be the final decision to sell, not that it's been sold. Um, I think that that might be, might be clarifying, might clarify it. Any other feedback, uh, Jeff? So Lisa, can I just ask you when you say uh, to sell, you're along the lines of Scott's to pursue a sale as opposed to, compl to complete a sale. Yeah, I think that's good information to know before the sales actually occurred. Uh, so Rob Hamilton, NASDAQ, uh, we were a little bit split on our group as well. Um, and part of it, I think, is the discussion has unfolded. You know, uh, I when I first read this, I was thinking, does that mean the legislature or the governor? You know, are they're conceivably the highest level, at least as I read it. And others thought, oh, no, that means it's been delegated to someone that has that that authority to do so. So kind of getting back to is there a policy or a dele an act of delegation? And um, I was also supportive of the we've there's an activity that has committed us to to the process of, of getting into the sale to the to what lisa just said and what scott had said earlier on commitment to enter into uh pursuit of a sale i think was uh where we where we were landing any other discussion all right seeing none so back to you deborah Thank you. So the other piece of the criteria for, as for classification is held for sale that we'll be talking about this week is the time frame, which in the exposure draft was that it's probable that sale will be finalized within one year of the financial statement date. Uh, based on the feedback received to that piece of the requirement, there are four alternatives that the board will be considering. Alternative one is to carry forward that ED proposal of one year from the financial statement date. Alternative two is to use a longer time frame because some governments take longer to sell capital assets, um, possibly two or three years being that time frame. Alternative three was to not have a time frame and just make it the sale is probable of being finalized. Um, alternative four is to have a use the time frame as a subclassification so that the capital assets would be held for sale and then reported in two pieces those probable of being sold within one year and those that are beyond that date. So discussion question number six is which of those four alternatives for time frame would you support in a final statement and why? Well, I got mine up first, Lisa Washburn and FMA. Um, I agree with alternative four. I think it's important to know whether or not we're talking about a near term um, sale or something that's longer term in terms of, you know, when is that liquidity from the sale expected to arrive? Ileana? Ileana Press, I see. I, I would say uh, either alternative one or alternative four, but definitely not anything that's longer than that. I mean, if, if not defined. Matt? Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. Uh, I, I think I like alternative four the best of these, but as I was thinking about this a little bit more, I guess I, I, I don't have enough information about these types of transactions to kind of understand how long these things typically take. So I just I, I had a question for some of our, our local government folks. How often does it take more than a year to execute these types of transactions? <laughs> okay, there we go then. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Sophia? So as I thought through different scenarios, uh, I thought I landed on three, alternative three, <laughs> um, with the thinking is that it would be flexible enough to capture many different layers of governments. And the scenario, I kept trying to think of different types of scenarios that could play out. One that I thought of was just a prison, uh, selling a prison, for example, or the land. Um, a uh, big development type of situation that could take multiple years. And the language that I uh, held to is probable of being finalized is what number uh, alternative three says, probable of being finalized. So this is, uh, you know, 
past the decision making mode. This is uh, you're getting into the window of when it, when a deal may be finalized, but to give enough flexibility of different um, just the different variations of government, I thought that that one made the most sense instead of trying to pigeonhole every situation into a year and then subcategorize it and, and things like that. So that, that was the thinking. Thanks. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, Michael and then Chris. Yeah, I was going to say, I like uh, alternative four. Um, basically, echoing what Lisa said, I don't really have much to add to that, but choice four. Uh, Chris and then Harriet. Hi, Chris Clark, representing National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, mostly, I just I don't have an answer or an alternative to pick. I'm just going to say what jumped into my head being from a rural state. Um, and so many of our school districts have declining enrollment. So we what jumped into my head was prisons, school buildings. And I'm from Kansas, so there's not a lot of people that want to buy those. So it's forever, if ever. So just factor that in mind. Not a lot of people are wanting to buy empty government buildings in Kansas. <laughs> uh, Harriet and then Michelle. Harriet Richardson, Association of Local Government Auditors. So I um, like number four. Um, the I think you know the ones that if you know it's you you the government agency usually knows if it's going to be sold within a year. So that's the first component. Those not being pro probable being sold within a year. If you have it for sale, it could be forever. Um, but you also have those that are going to take longer than a year, depending on the due diligence that needs to be done to finalize a sale. So I like having the two components in there. Okay. Michelle and then Stephen. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Uh, we landed on alternative one, probability of selling within a year. We think that's better than alternative two and three. We think it'd be hard to estimate if you go out beyond a year, which is why we liked it better than both alternatives one and, and or I'm sorry, two and three for that matter. Alternative four we thought has some merits, but as we thought about it, if the goal is liquidity information, I'm not sure what, if it's very helpful to tell our user that you have a capital asset that's held for sale when it could be, to, to Chris's point, years and years and years until that asset is held for sale. So we landed back to alternative one. All right, Stephen and Joni. Uh, Stephen Stewart, Governmental Research Association. Uh, we supported Alternative 4. Uh, we thought it would provide users the most realistic and complete picture of held for sale assets. Um, it would both inform the liquidity analysis, and then you could also assess, help assess the government's intent to um, how to dispose of assets. The other options, 2 and 3, um, just thought it, it kind of introduced uncertainty um, and maybe didn't offer as high quality of information as alternative four. Uh, Joni and then Rob. Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. I like to with Sophia number three. And as I just know that we had something that was sold and we thought it was going to happen and it was a nonprofit that was going to buy it and then they had to raise the money. So we would have put it as probable of being sold within a year. That took several years to happen. Then I was reflecting and I know Christine's going to be talking herself, but I just remember listening to what you said too. What, how we Things take a lot longer than we think and that being able to estimate with probability what's going to be sold with one year and one's going to be sold greater than one year. That's really a hard thing to put in, in an audited financial statement. Thank you. Uh, Rob and then Christine. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Rob Weber, Bond Raiders. Um, I think probably alternative number four probably makes the most sense. Um, and as I think about it, and in all the conversations that we've had with local governments over the past Oh, I have always had local governments over the past years. You, know, you hear all the time about a, a, an entity wanting to sell something, and then you talk to them the following year, they're, oh, I still want to sell it. Still sitting there. Um, and so I think if you have these things on here that, that are, are one year or even two or three years, they lose a lot of value. Because I look at this and say, well, this, is, this has been on the market now for four or five years. Um, the probability to be finalized, I think, goes back to that same concept. 
you could probably be finalized, but what does that really mean? Um, so I think I fall on number four, which is kind of a little more broad um, um, from our perspective. Christine and then David. Christine Brock, I see me. Uh, I would, I would go. I look at alternative four. Um, certainly, I, you know, while I personally have some passion for this uh, this uh, topic because I've had to live it several, quite a few times in the last seven years, being at a suburban uh, government, local government, but also um, my colleagues who are at places that are they're going through what Chris is describing, trying to sell you know old school buildings or. Um, there's, there's certainly just lots of, this is a topic that a lot of, a lot of financial officers, um, have, have lived with in some form or fashion, but, um, certainly I do appreciate that a user wants, could want more information because there is public information about it, especially when a local government approves an MOU and what, what happens with that. And, um, so, uh, alternative four, I think would allow the, the staff to be able to, to make, make professional judgment on what category that, that potential sale would land in because the closer you you get to selling within a finalizing within a, selling within a year, you know that you're getting in, a gov in our world pretty close. <laughs> but if you have terms of an MOU that nothing's been satisfied, you're probably not within a year. So thank you, David. Then Scott, uh, David Goldman, National League of Cities. Um, the time frame is based on when the reporting um, is triggered in the previous question that we talked about, I would think. Um, once the government gives the go, the, the official go ahead to sell capital asset, it could happen pretty quickly since in my experience, um, you know, us, us as staff has already done some legwork to provide information to the city council, such as estimated value and other impacts of, of the sale of the property so that the uh, governing body can make their decision. I mean, before the official go ahead triggers, there might be discussions at a workshop type meeting but sometimes workshops, you know, that's not really official. That it could just be um, elected officials just kicking around ideas that may or may not happen. And it would just be real difficult for the finance director or the county manager to be put in a position with option four of putting something um, in the long-term column based on a workshop idea that may not happen. So um, I would recommend that for the purposes of more certainty in the financial statements for the users of the financial statements, that we lean towards option one. Scott? Yes, uh, Scott Domini with AGA. Um, I mean, our, our group mostly thought the one year time frame was sufficient. Um, but again, I, I think what you're seeing in this discussion <laughs> is uh, the reality that uh, it's really hard to know what the time frame is and, and things just take long in government. Um, so it's it, it, I think it comes down for the board discussion to what are you what information are you trying to present to users? Are you trying to present like, hey, there's something that is probably going to get sold, i.e., like money's going to come in for this, or are you trying to differentiate like, hey, there's these capital assets that are shown as capital assets, but they're actually just being held for sale. So um uh I think the only thing that our group didn't like <laughs> was that was the fact that alternative four has the two components. So it's just, it's just expanding that burden. And, and we wish that there could just be one way or the other um, because, because it is, it's really hard to know. And, and I think that when you get to that one year time timeframe um, uh, you also have to think about the quality of that information because it is so hard for uh, people to identify and maybe will be a lot more influenced by, um, optimism or pessimism uh, than 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 actual uh, evidence. That's all. Can oh, you, you know what? Actually, I'm going to continue on a little bit more. Just just a little, just a little Gatsby geek stuff. Because uh, I mean, normally uh, AGA is, we're very in favor of convergence, and this would be an area where it wouldn't converge with FASB. But uh, we also feel like if there's a simplification here, uh, that that would be appropriate for the government environment. Like if we just remove the time frame requirement, I, I, I do think that that is appropriate because uh, there is a lot more lengthier and uncertain uh, sale timeframes with government. And I guess I'll just defer to the users about whether, um, you know, it's the same uh, interest 
uh, I, I think I'd perceive that the, that user interest in the timing of revenues would be a little less for governments uh, in these types of scenarios than for the private sector. But that's all. That's really all. Matt? Well, I, I just wanted to, sorry, Matt, Harvey Insurance Industry Investors. The, the only thing I would say to Scott, and, and I think he makes some great points, is that like a lot of uh, some of this information that you know we in the user community talk about, a lot of this stuff isn't important until it is, um, and so you can have a situation where you know in and you know be careful about how I say this, but we we try not to invest in the types of entities where this type of thing is going to matter. But there are situations where this does matter, where, you know, if it, it might matter whether or not a particular community, a small school district in Kansas is able to make its debt service payment in six months, whether or not they can complete the sale of this thing that they're looking at. So it's it, it's tricky because I, I am all for, you know, simplifying and not having these two categories. Um, but again, that's that's that one piece of it, it's it's an example of a type of piece of information where it's not important until it is. And if you don't have it, you're going to wish that you had it. Rob, uh, Rob Weber, Bond Raiders. I, I, I'll piggyback on what Matthew was just saying because I think when we have seen local governments face financial stress because of budgetary issues, they've done so because they 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 failed to they they included sale of assets into their into their budget and then they failed to sell them yeah. and they that 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 sale that i mean i've seen it from one or two of these places where they failed to sell that but that 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 asset for three four or five years that they've had on the books and that's the part i think that leads them down the path of of financial ruin because they've been banking on this thing for so long and so i don't know how you i don't know how you in like maybe there's a, a a way of putting it in that 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 asset is not just being held for sale but it's also part of the budget and you may not necessarily see that when you're looking at the financial statement if you know what i mean yeah. scott yeah scott from aga again uh so if they if a government reports an asset it's held for sale and they say we expect to sell that within one year would you believe them i mean that that's just that's just a question to the value yeah after today no <laughs> <laughs> all right th i mean that's thank you <laughs> any other discussion on this uh, so for, for my group, Rob, from, from NASAC, um, the, the committee was much more supportive of Alternative 1. I think I was the outlier. I liked Alternative 4, um, mostly because I think it, I, I like that it tells the old picture. And it, I think it better avoids a scenario where something is in and it's completely gone. And it's, it stays maybe, with, hopefully within the, uh, um, hopefully it doesn't bounce back and forth between the, the one year and the not. But um, I think it tells a better picture tells a better story. Uh, and I think for me, it would be easier, almost like the operating, non-operating. I know it's, I know I'm, I've committed myself down to a path where I'm looking to sell this asset. It's just how probable is it? And I like that probability is the threshold that's being uh, employed here. Um, and so it just kind of depends on, on that. And by the time I issue the statements, I'm six months into the year anyways. And so I should have a pretty good idea whether the next six months, I feel like this is actually gonna execute that sale or not uh, to help the categorization. Um, so that was where I landed, but again, I was the outlier from from my group. But I think we're back to you now for question eight. All right, so one more thing on the topic of capital assets held for sale, and that is a potential additional disclosure item. So we had a respondent to the exposure draft who suggested additional disclosure of liens or liabilities associated with the capital assets that are held for sale. Uh, the pre-agenda research did not get that specific into what information about capital assets held for sale users would use. Um, so we don't specifically have information on that, but we can um, perhaps make some, uh, glean some uh, things from what they did tell us about they would find it useful and what they would use it for. Uh, however, this was also not part of the exposure draft proposal, and so there may be concerns about adding it to a final statement without uh, 
additional due process. So our discussion question number eight is, do you believe governments should disclose liens or liabilities associated with capital assets that have been classified as held for sale and why? Scott? Uh, Scott Devaney with AGA. Uh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> you know, if a sale is really that material, that much tied to the government's liquidity, which is, I think, what uh, people would be concerned about, then a description of what's going on should already be an MDNA. It should already be triggered by other note disclosure requirements. And, um, you know, in any case, I, I, I think our group <laughs> can totally understand why someone would be interested in this kind of stuff. Um, but the purpose of financial statements isn't to analyze specific transactions. So I just, I just really question the need for this kind of level of granularity to achieve financial reporting uh, objectives. Thanks. All right. uh, Matt? Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, with... <laughs> With the caveat that I think Scott's uh, Scott's point about materiality is a good one. Um, I, I mean, you know, Bob earlier mentioned about you know the routine sale of fire trucks and police equipment. If if those you know need a new carburetor or something like that, I don't need that in the financial statement. So I think some sort of materiality note or some sort of materiality requirement around that would be good. But to me, having a lien or having a liability associated with an asset held for sale relates directly both to the time frame. And and the price that you're going that you potentially could realize from the previous question. So I I don't think you can necessarily disentangle those two. Uh, Lisa Washburn. Lisa Washburn and FMA. I agree with uh, I agree with Matt everything he just said about this being an important thing to disclose. Right. Sophia. I ag agree. I think it would be. A prudent thing to disclose now how it's disclosed I get, there's a, a number of avenues you can take to disclose it but if the whole reason why we're going down this path is to try to ascertain li liquidity and um and but you can't liquidate because you've got you know significant liens and liabilities then i think it, it's a good uh a material thing to to know um but again open to the how how it's disclosed but i do think it's important and prudent to 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 disclose it somewhere. Thanks. All right, uh, Harriet. Harriet Richardson, Association of Local Government Auditors. Um, my answer was along with Matt's, yes, absolutely. And and the reason is, even though I, I get Scott's point about you have, you know, the the liens and liabilities already presented on the, li on the um, financial statements, when you're talking about selling a specific capital asset, that's going to affect that line item, uh, the total overall line item of li liens and liabilities. And you want to know what are you really going to get what, after you sell this item? And if there's a lien or a liability against it, it's going to be reduced the amount of proceeds you're actually going to realize. So for that reason, I felt like it's important to identify it separately um, for when you have a capital asset for sale. Thanks. Uh, Ileana? Ileana Perez, ICI. I also agree that it should be in there. Anything that can impair that end number that you're, you know, looking to get out of that asset um, is something that should be disclosed and would speak to the actual liquidity you benefit from. And I also don't think it would be that disclosure, I don't think would show up anywhere in MDA. Like, it, it wouldn't have to. And in this case, you would it would be a requirement for it to be there. Rob? Rob Weber, Bond Raiders. Um, I don't think I can say it any better than Harriet did, so I will just say that I completely agree with everything she just said. So, Christine, uh, Christine Brock, ICMA. I, I'm going to agree with Scott and say no on this one. Um, I just, I wouldn't want to open up any sort of um, unintentional liability to the the local government because of unknown liabilities that someone would look back on this document, such as um, environmental floodplains, things that um, really weren't relevant to the to the local government when the local government necessarily was the owner to, or did, the local government didn't know when they were the owner. And um, would this be implied as taking away the, the buyer, the, the buyer's right to do due diligence to decide if they really wanted to, to buy the property? Uh, Michelle? Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Um, we actually spent a fair bit of time talking about this one. We first said, okay, 
so, sounds fine to us, um, but that's not where we ended up. So we thought in some cases it provides some good information. So let's say you have a fire truck, you're selling it, it's got a, a loan on it. We, we could get on board with that. But let's say you have a situation where you've got um, an asset and the historical cost of that asset is very, very low. And for whatever reason, there's a liability associated with it, like land, for example. Let's say there's um, pollution remediation. So you're almost done remediating. You're about to sell that asset. We think that the juxtaposition of the historical cost of that asset to the liability might actually mislead a reader and, and actually not be helpful to a reader. Um, the other thing that we struggled with was when you say the um, lien or liability associated with the capital asset, we could think of situations where um, you've got a large bond issue. Let's say you have a bond issue for a municipal complex. Lots of different capital assets are being acquired with that debt. Are you then required to somehow associate and parse out that liability when you go to sell that capital asset and disclose it? I think that would be very difficult. Suzanne? Now I'm getting confused. Uh, Suzanne Lowenson, American Accounting Association, because I was in, in agreement with them, with Matt and Harriet, um, because I do, and, and actually kind of for the reason that Michelle was saying, sometimes it's really difficult to distinguish what debt is associated with what asset. And so if the main reason for you wanting to, um, that you wanted to sell the asset and to, to uh, you know, obtain the proceeds, then actually it is important information to show to the to the users that, okay, yes, we have this asset and then here's a liability associated with it in the same place. And so, but to parse it out is difficult. And then also, you know, the the historical value, the, the, the uh, you know, book value versus the pro, I mean, that, that's so, so I, that's why I was starting to put my thing down when you called me. <laughs> Scott? Yeah, Scott from AGA again. Uh, yeah, I totally appreciate the discussion. I, I assume that because, um, I mean, these are I think everyone can agree that if you're looking at a major sale, then you want to know all this information about it. Um, but I just just one one response. Um, just remember, we're not reporting the the expected proceeds. We're not reporting the price. And so I think that any any kind of thought about like what are the expected proceeds? What might we, they be offset against? Uh, is totally speculative. Um, and so again, I just, I'm wondering about like, if you're going to go that way, then you almost have to have a conversation with the government about all of that. And um, I, I think that the the main value of the disclosure is to allow for that conversation for users, as opposed to going through the transaction. So that's all. Darren? Yeah, I think the if the if the asset acts as security for a particular debt and it's required to get paid off, it would make sense to have that disclosure included. All this discussion and I was thinking about this through the rest of the discussion. Um, I don't think the ED gives much guidance in the way of classification um, in the statement in that position, and I don't think I've heard discussion or there were questions around classification. But um, if we're doing a probability assessment and the assets are probable, deemed probable being sold within the next year and we're evaluating classification as current. Um, a, some of the discussion here, you know, could that create disparity or diversity in practice around there? And um, could you end up with assets classified as current, debt classified as non-current and create some issues um, there? So, thank you. Yes, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Thomas, National Association of Bond Lawyers. To answer Michelle's question, your bond lawyer will make sure that those liens that are within that big bond issue, that and if you've sold them, that's their job to say what's been released. They give an opinion to that. Um, so that may make it either harder or simpler. I don't know. Um, but I, I do agree that the disclosure of liens and liabilities is um would be should be disclosed for all the reasons that Harriet said. Any other discussion, Ileana? Ileana, press I see. I just kind of going back to that debt question because I would figure that like unless you had a leasehold interest or a mortgage interest in the property that like you otherwise wouldn't 
have the lien related to the debt on the facility. But it also kind of goes back to that same idea of having the necessary approvals in place at the highest level, whether that is the bond lawyer approving that you can sell the asset, in fact, or the county city council approving that they want to sell it, just kind of meeting the threshold of like this asset can be sold. Any other discussion on this? But can I, Matt or Ileana, can I ask you one of your question? Without knowing the proceeds of the sale, how much is knowing the liens and liabilities helping you? Because there's nothing, in, the, the point's right, there's nothing in here right now that tells you, you just know book value of that asset. You don't know the potential sale price of that asset. I mean, but the fact that you know that they're not going to get whatever the expectation, whether whatever range uh, that they're going to get, you know that it's not going to be maximized to that full amount, knowing that there could be something that is going to be, have to be netted out on the back end, right? And it's okay. And then that's, that's, that's good to know. And it's okay with you that you don't know what that range is. Like the government's not telling you what that range is. You're, you might have an idea of what you think that range might be, mm -hmm. but the, the report itself is not telling you the range. You've come up with that. And now you know something to offset it against. That's, o that's okay in your mind. I, I think so because, I mean, the idea isn't that, like, I know that they're going to get X amount next year and I have to net this exact amount. The idea is to say, like, there's either potential liquidity there or there's not. And I, I, I don't give full credit to that liquidity, honestly, until the, the sale has taken place and it's not. I... I Personally, I'm, I'm the more conservative side type of analyst. I know that there's other folks who kind of want to use probabilities and models and all. I'm kind of old school. I like to see the, the money in the bank. <laughs> I mean, completely setting aside the range of potential outcomes aside, just the presence of a lien or liability affects the probability of whether or not a sale will occur for me. Yeah, and I was going to say the same thing. And I, I think that the, having that information is an important piece of information to know, and then you can go and ask other questions about it. So for me, Rob Hamilton from NASAC, uh, just from our perspective, again, I think I was the outlier from our group. Um, the uh, One of the uh, members of the committee thought it would ask, would create more questions than answer, answers, so they were uh, not supportive of it. Uh, for me, I, I feel like it, uh, it only tells part of the story to exclude it, and it feels a little bit odd to not include it if we know that there's an associated lien or liability. Um, so adding it makes sense to me. Um, and then otherwise, the, I feel like we would be, um, just wouldn't have the clarity that we otherwise have available potentially to us. Oh, Chris. Thank you. I just had a question for everybody who um, supported the, the lien or liability to Christine's point. Um, is there a general idea of what you believe that lien or liability to be? So um, there are a lot of different things that could represent a liability, right? Um, and her point was that not thinking about the mortgages or the liens, but thinking more about these other items that might turn out to be liabilities related to the property in the future. Um, and I, I don't know how far she was going to take that, but just curious, is everyone here talking about like the, the debt against the property and and that's it and not really all the other types of liabilities that are out there um and just wanted to make sure we were on the same page when everybody's talking about liabilities because she had a good point i'll say i, I think it's a known liability or lien um versus something that may be you know an unknowable thing at, at present not asking anyone to be clairvoyant and figure out that you know there's going to be an environmental claim but if you do have debt or some sort of mechanics lien or something against the property then that's something that should be disclosed yeah i'd, I'd agree with leisha it's it's a question of what is known now if you know they they get close and they're doing some surveys or something like that and they discover well there's some potential you know, contaminant here that could affect things, that's something that's not known at the time. And, and that's, that's fine. It's kind of known existing situations, I think, are the type of thing that we're concerned about. Just, just pulling on that, though, known amount or known? Because those are two, two different things, right? So would the entity be expected, shoot, now I know that there's something there, 
I need to figure out an estimate and a value of this known liability? Or are you just talking about, uh, you know, so known that it's there or know the amount as of that time? Known. And if the amount is known at the time, disclosure of the amount. But if the amount is not known, that's okay too. We just want to know the existence, that, that there's knowledge of, that there is an existing liability or lien, even if the amount of that is not known at the time. Other feedback for Chris? Uh, Christine? I'll, since, uh, since Chris uh, just mentioned my comments, I, I was speaking not, so, I, certainly if you've got debt that, and that, that's one separate thing. I, but I was thinking more of when a government owns property, it's been greenfield, but yet um, the value could be a whole lot higher if you allowed someone to come in and put multifamily housing and it turns out that the property maybe can't, won't support it or um, just a lot, these liabilities that, that their governments can own properties that have either environmental, for example, environmental issues that the owner doesn't know, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't impact um, if someone's looking to blame somebody because they had a, built a pro forma based on um, the property use in the future, not being owned by the government and being owned by someone who was going to maximize a different type of use. So that, that, that was my, that was where my comments were coming from. All right, uh, Scott, we got about one minute. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. Uh, hey, just want to point out one other thing about this. Uh, it, uh, we talk about the property, but the current disclosure is just amounts, it, which are inclusive of could be a whole bunch of different things. And, and I really love how you know, with alternative two, uh, the previous alternative two, <laughs> it, it could it, it it sets up like a really elegant disclosure. You've got your table for capital assets, and all you got to do is add one more column of like, hey, what of all this is held for sale? Um, but with all of this lean stuff, like we're now we're thinking of not just this table disclosure of, of numbers. Now we're talking about whole narrative disclosure where we have to identify particular properties and then try to link them to descriptions of liens or liabilities. So it really is like quite a, a different, at least in my mind, an expansion of what this note disclosure looks like and, and what it would take to prepare it. So that's all. All right. Uh, any final thoughts, Deborah? All right. Thank you, everyone. It is 3.16. We are at our break time. Um, so we will go till uh, 3.30. Uh, we will come back here and talk about infrastructure assets. Thanks, everyone. Are we about ready to uh, reconvene our meeting, everyone? No worries. Are you joining us? Yes. All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. We're going to uh, get our meeting back together. Uh -oh. I'm not good at whistling, so thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we have uh, one more topic on our agenda, and then so we can all get to our, our dinner and social hour that we'll get to enjoy. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time to get through this. Uh, so with, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Black, who's going to go through the uh, or introduce the member for feedback for infrastructure assets. Chair? Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Last December, when I introduced this topic, I was trying to uh, remind people of the importance of this issue of infrastructure assets. And I asked how many of you used public infrastructure to arrive at the meeting. And uh, as expected, most of you did in some way, shape or form. This time I'll ask how many people have read a news report in the last month or two about the condition of infrastructure in our country. <laughs> and there's a lot of hands raised. If you looked at the bond buyer this morning, you saw one on the front page. So it continues to be an important topic, uh, but that's not news to you guys because this was your highest rated topic at our prioritization this time last year. Um, and we then subsequently added it to the agenda uh, and are, have started working, been working on it ever since. At our last December meeting, we talked with you about some of uh, the recognition issues and measurement issues related to infrastructure assets. And this time we have required supplementary information related to infrastructure assets for you, considering both current required and potential new ones. Scott, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, we have a paper before you today on some of the tentative decisions the board has made since the last time uh, the council met uh, in relation to required supplementary information. 
the board has also talked about other issues uh, since the last time the council met. Uh, those issues are related to notes to financial statements. Uh, however, the board didn't make any tentative decisions in relation to notes. Uh, what they did is come up with uh, various notes they want staff to do outreach to users uh, to get some level of, of how, I shouldn't say that, to determine whether uh, the essentiality criteria, I think is the better way to say that, uh, is met. And, and so uh, the staff is doing outreach on that right now and and we'll bring that back to the board for them to make, uh, you know, decisions uh, on uh, potential note disclosures. But in this paper, we have, as I said before, uh, the tentative required supplementary information the board has decided related to uh, infrastructure assets. Uh, Real quickly for a briefer of those, briefer, a uh, briefing uh, for those uh, that uh, don't deal with Gatsby's concept statements all the time. A uh, required supplementary information is shown on the bottom of page two in concepts three is defined uh, as information that the Gatsby has determined is essential for placing basic financial statements and notes to the basic financial statements in appropriate operational, economic, or historical context uh, and it has a clear and dem demonstrable relationship to the information in the basic financial statements or the notes to uh, financial statements. Uh, so the first section uh, that the board looked at is existing uh, required supplementary information required related to infrastructure assets and currently uh, the only required supplementary for me supplementary information for infrastructure assets are for those governments that uh, elect to use the modified approach to report their uh, infrastructure assets. So accordingly, as we've talked in the past with the council, uh, not a lot of governments elect to use the modified approach. So there are not a lot of governments that currently provide uh, required supplementary information in relation to infrastructure assets. Uh, so the board talked about the two uh, basic requirements that are out there now for those governments that do elect to use the modified approach. Uh, the first is a presentation of the assessed condition performed at least every three years and the dates of those uh, assessments. Uh, and then that condition assessment with the date of the assessment should be presented in RSI for the three most recently completed uh, assessments. Uh, and the second RSI requirement is a presentation of the estimated annual amount calculated at the beginning of the year to maintain and preserve at or above the condition level that the government has established uh, and a comparison of that uh, estimated amount to the actual amount spent. Uh, and the current requirements state that that should be presented uh, for each of the past five reporting periods. Now, for each of those two RSI requirements, the board has tentatively decided that governments should continue to present that if they elect to use the modified approach uh, for infrastructure assets. Uh, and then uh, as far as the timing of those presentations, the board continued uh, for the first of the two, the uh, assess condition, to have that be for the most three recent uh, completed assessments. Uh, but for the second presentation, instead of for it being the previous five years or five years, they decided that it should be the previous 10 years. Uh, and those decisions were made to an extent on consistently with other RSI presentations the board requires for 10 years. Now for that first one, because we're saying the minimum requirement is every three years, you can't hit three years exactly. Uh, but if the governments uh, elect to do the assessment every three years, that would be over a nine year uh, period. And so that's why uh, one of the reasons the board tentative decided that. So I'll ask the questions as they're presented kind of in two ways. The first question will be agreement uh, or your feedback on the board's tentative decision that these two items should be included in RSI. And then we'll follow after that discussion uh, with the second question as far as those timing uh, relationships. So the first question, do you agree with those 10 decisions uh, to include the uh, to include the assessed condition performed at least uh, every three years and including those dates of assessments? 
uh, as well as the estimated annual amount uh, to maintain or preserve at or above the condition level established and compared with the actually actual amounts spent. Bob? Bob Scott, GF4A. Yeah, I've spoken on infrastructure assets when we were prioritizing and incredibly difficult uh, topic just because of the magnitude of it and the complexity of it. Um, and the city I was at for 31 years, no longer at, we really tried to maintain our assets and we did condition assessments on a regular basis. I personally think three years is a little fast for larger entities with literally hundreds and hundreds of lane miles of road, et cetera. But the, I mean, I agree with the concept. I've been amazed though, that when we did the condition assessments that they weren't always nearly as precise as we were expecting. And I remember one time when a road that was literally built two years earlier came back uh, at a 75 and we're going, what, how can this be? And then the, they said, well, you know, you did a brush finish on the concrete. Well, yes, we did. That's standard for, for concrete streets. Well, it, the, the infrared picked it up as cracks. Okay. They're not cracked though. And so, we literally had to go back for, and we used our uh, condition assessments for our bond elections. And we tried to do them about every five years for our bond elections. And we went back and we actually, what we finally ended up doing was discarding some of the condition assessments and taking pictures of different streets to show the citizens committee because we felt like that was a better reflection of the streets than uh, we were getting from the condition assessment. So I think if you use the uh, modified approach, uh, you have to do something in RSI. And so I would be supportive of condition assessments, whether three years is uh, the right number. Again, I think it's that's getting fairly um, frequent. But again, my, my, one of my concerns about the modified approach is a historic cost number 30 or 40 years down the road, particularly if you've issued debt to maintain it, you, you might be creating a deficit for yourself uh, using the condition assessment or the, the modified approach because you're at, still at historic cost of what it cost 40 years ago and you've replaced major parts of the road. Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. So uh, I, I have a two-part answer. Uh, so first, just with the question kind of in front of us as written, yes, uh, I, I agree with the board's tentative decisions um, on, uh, on both things. Um, I would say in terms of the three, you know, having the condition performed at least every three years, Given the nature of these assets, I think I can be flexible on that. Um, I, I think, you know, if, if there's pushback around three years, I think five years is probably okay. Again, given the nature of kind of these these long-lived capital assets. But I, I would just say at a broader level that, that this paper is maybe the first time ever I've, I've felt like I'm being taunted by by the Gatsby because – it's all you're, you're talking about all this wonderful information that I would like to have, but because nobody ever uses this, it, it's just dangling the stuff out in front of me that I'm never going to get because nobody ever uses this and you're never going to require anybody to use this. So, again, I, I'm agree with everything that's being said here. I'm hopeful that whatever comes next after this um, will have something a little bit more concrete in terms of information like this that we're looking for. But yes, in, in a narrow sense, yes, agree. 
Um, if three years is too stringent, you know, five is fine, but I really do wish I could have all this information. Lisa? Lisa Washburn, NFMA. I really don't like to follow Matt because he's so funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I will say that I agree as well. I agree with um, keeping this information as is with the questions. But like Matt said, I think that the, the issue is that we just really need information like this about the, um, the infrastructural assets that governments have and what the um, what the unfunded or the accrued deferred maintenance is. And so anything that helps us to understand what these future liabilities are going to be on a government is really important for us to be able to analyze kind of the future fiscal condition of an entity. Zach? Zach Jackson representing uh, NASBO. Um, one of the auditors I spoke with liked the idea of going with a longer time period. And um, I, what she mentioned was that, uh, you know, something like three years may not cover the uh, single term of office uh, for a, an official or a board member under audit. And so going with something, you know, at least four years to, to make sure it was uh, beyond that term of office. Harriet? Harriet Richardson, Association of Local Government Auditors. So I I agreed with this. I think A and B tie into each other. If you have the assessed condition and you're saying how much you're going to um, be putting into maintain or preserve it, it gives you a, a sense of whether that uh, assess uh, that. Um, Assess condition is going to stay kind of at that level, go up or go down. So I think that's useful information. As far as the three years, so the three years resonated with me because um, I live in a, a subdivision that's governed by HOA. I'm not on their board, but I've been a thorn in our board president's mm -hmm. side because as he calls me, a stickler for following the rules. Um, Washington State actually has a law for homeowners associations to do an assessment of their assets every three years. And it has to be a physical assessment at least once in that three year period and then the others are updates that are formed by what you've put into it, kind of what this is saying, or um, if you haven't, um, how you're going to make, maintain it down the road. So I wasn't, I didn't really have a, an issue with the three years, but governments are a lot bigger than homeowners associations. And so then it raised a question for me, do you do everything on the same three year cycle or can you rotate that out? And I didn't feel like that question was really answered uh, with the way this is presented. And I think that would be helpful for government agencies to know, because if you're expected to do everything, every, you know, within this three set three year cycle, that is really burdensome for governments, which have a lot of, um, a lot of assets and um, they deteriorate in different ways at different paces. And so really kind of thinking about, do you want a set three year period for everything? And also if so, does it need to be on the same three year cycle or can that be different cycles of that three years? So just a few things to think about with that. Ileana? Eliana Perez, I see. I, I also agree with it, but I, I understand the three year can be very limiting or constraining, especially for some governments, um, maybe even larger governments or different types of entities. So I like Harriet's comment about maybe there being um, different timing thresholds, although I know uniformity is probably much appreciated for many of the folks here. Um, but yes, I agree. More information. Great. I love it. Hope everybody does it. <laughs> Rob? Uh, Rob Weber, uh, bond raiders. Uh, the asset condition and the depreciation of the assets is something that we already take into account when we look at our methodologies, whether it's a utility methodology or a local government methodology. Uh, greater <clears throat> transparency. You know, we're trying to back into that number as it is now, and greater transparency behind that would be beneficial. So we agree. Um, three years, five years, I don't think it it doesn't make a difference in the grand scheme of things. Um, longer term, I think, uh, Sophia, I think you made it, or uh, I think it was Sophia made a good point about the, you know, the length of term of, of someone's being in office. That, that wasn't something I thought about, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a, a good point. So we're gonna agree with that. Bob, did you have some follow-up comments? 
Matt, this is Bob Scott from GFOA, and I may look like a mild-mannered accountant, but I'm really the ghost of Christmas future, and I have good news for you, is not everything has to be in the financial statements or themselves, and governments all over are doing condition assessments, and typically those condition assessments are available on that government's website. Uh, we published, my prior city published uh, the last three condition assessments that we had done in preparation for our, our bond election. So there's a lot of information out there that may not be in the financial statements, but to me that's okay because there's some things that belong and don't belong, and, and I'm not sure modified or, you know, the that alternate approach, modified approach, is really going to provide all that much better information. But the real thing is, are they doing condition assessments? Lisa? Yeah, uh, Lisa Washburn, NFMA. I agree with Bob. I mean, I on the point of, I think that the, the most important thing is knowing, having clarity or, or some insight into that the the liability or that the conditions are being assessed and that we understand what the amount, whether or not they're, what they need to spend to maintain it and are they doing that? And so, you know, I think that being able to get that information, whether it be through a modified approach or some other disclosure is perfectly fine. And I don't really care as much about the time frame of three, five, make it even seven years, like what, whatever that time frame is. I just want to know that it's being measured and I want to know whether or not they're maintaining the assets and what, if they're not, what's that deferred maintenance looking like? Zach, do you have some comments still? Yes. All right, uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Stewart, Governmental Research Association. You know, on this topic, um, you know, we're, as a user group, you know, we like having sufficient information. I mean, one of the, I think to Matt's point, I mean, one of the missed opportunities is that governments don't really follow the mod the modified approach, and not many do. And so, if it could, if there could be a an adjustment to, say, something like the time period to lengthen it to something that is not three years, but could be, you know, five years or or a little bit longer, that might bring down the cost of complying with the modified approach and then maybe encourage more governments to adopt it voluntarily, which would be good for, for users. So that's something to consider. I like I appreciate the discussion y'all have had. Uh, Rob and then Lisa. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I guess just to respond to, to Bob's comment about it, that a lot of places are doing it and a lot of places are making it available. The problem is one, I can't find it. And two, it's not consistently done amongst uh, all the governments and how it's being presented. And I think this is, that's where this is an opportunity to be able to provide consistency so that as a, as a rating agency who's, who's, who's taking in all of this data can easily scrape the data and pull it into our systems um, in a way that um, is efficient and um, uh, digestible. Because if it's if it's done seventeen different ways, that's just not helpful. Lisa, Lisa Washburn, NFMA. Um, yeah, I would I would definitely be supportive of elongating the period, but I don't think that um, we're going. If it's left to be voluntary, I don't think that the information is going to be forthcoming. Um, you know, I. Even governments that wanted to implement the modified approach, if you, you know, you can read them online, like they considered it, you know, there's the cost associated with it, but it's also the condition assessment um, and having to report that and say if they didn't maintain the conditions to that level, that I think is somewhat of the the spook factor, right? Like, well, I'm not going to do that because it's, you know, I'm going to make my citizens all, you know, crazy that I'm not maintaining my assets. So I, I think that if there's a way that we can get more information on a non-voluntary basis, um, that would be very beneficial. <laughs> 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 I, well, you know, I, you know, in disclosure in general, I, you know, I've seen that voluntary 
asking asking for voluntary disclosures just is it, it just doesn't work. Um, you you know you can work for ten years and have everybody in an agreement that we're going to voluntary disclose something that's extraordinarily important, only to have to have like the SEC come in and step in and say no, you got to do it now. So I just um, you know I'm jaded. <laughs> Chris, uh, mine's just. Mine is just more of a question for um, Harriet brought up a good point that resonated with me. It just questioning how this works. Is it everything year one, year four, year seven, or is it some things year one and year four, other things year two and five, three and six? How does it work or what was envisioned here? Current requirements allow it to be completed over the three year cycle. So okay. it doesn't have to all be at once. Okay. Um, Scott. Yeah, I was trying to save my, uh, Scott from AGA. Yeah. I was trying to save my comments for a uh, question too, but, uh, I just wanted to respond to Lisa, um, with the idea that governments may stay away because they're going to fall under that condition assessment. And just to clarify, like if they fall under that condition assessment, even for one year, they can't do the modified approach. So we've had a government in Washington that wanted to do the modified approach, they set the, their condition assessment, they fell under it one year, and so they had to go back to historical cost, which, by the way, is ridiculously hard and cost, you know, expensive for them to bounce between the two. So this is not a question here, but I just wanted to raise it just as a bonus, bonus, Scott. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe if, if that's something that... Um, that uh, the users are more interested in just getting the information, even if they fall below that that threshold, then maybe that shouldn't be a condition anymore, uh, because that certainly is a barrier for some governments to report. Um, it, it, in fact, it's they they literally can't report because uh, they would not meet that you know any kind of reasonable condition assessment. Matt. I mean, I, I, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors, I, I should probably apologize because I'm the one that's caused this to go completely off the rails and away from the question that was is in front of us. Uh, but that said, uh, some of the things that have been said here, um, I mean, first, Bob, I only wish that all you know government finance officers and managers were as conscientious and thoughtful as you were. Uh, unfortunately, they are not. Um, and to Lisa's point, you know, oftentimes having kind of these options or it, it Oftentimes, as we've seen, especially in this case, these options are, are not going to be taken up, and so we're not going to see this. But one thing that I, I might ask Scott and the rest of the staff is, you know, and, and more to Bob's point, what are governments producing? Even if it's not something that's part of the financial statements, even if it's not something that's kind of around, you know, your typical depreciation schedules and things like that, is there something else that most governments are, are already producing that could somehow be incorporated? And A, how uniform is that? Because I know that's that's a completely separate issue kind of to Rob's point. If they're doing it 17 different ways, that's less helpful. But are, are they doing something right now that would be better than what we have, which is not much? All right. Um, so real quick, I know we're going to have to, we're starting to run short on time. Just a quick feedback from Margaret, Rob Hamilton from NASAC. Um, we were, um, only a couple of states used the modified approach. They didn't really have any concerns. So um, that was where I landed as well. Um, the one piece of the thing that came into my mind around if we elongate the amount of time between when we got to do the assessments, I think it's going to make them harder to do because part of the challenge is if you do it once every seven years, you might lose all the people that did the last one and you got to refigure it out again. And so I think that could be a challenge even at five years. That might be a little bit difficult. But back to you, Scott, for the next question. Okay. And then as I alluded to before, the second question is, do you agree with the time frame of the information presented? That is three assessments uh, and the dates of those three assessments, as well as 10 years of the amount uh, expected to be needed to maintain the assets at that level compared to the actual amount spent. Feedback for Scott. Scott Devaney. Yeah, Scott Devaney from AGA. Um, yeah, disagree. Um, totally respect the idea of trying to be consistent with other standards, but um, just for all the standards, we feel like 10 years is way too much. 
<laughs> rather than expanding the trend, I, I'd rather see it go back, you know, lower. Um, prefer to just present uh, three years uh, for 1A and 1B. Um, that would encompass the most recent complete assessment and, and match the scope of commentary and context in the MDNA. I mean, it's just, it's a cost. It's a cost to keep and support and trace and double check and fix all these numbers every year. And I think, um, you know, with GASB 100, that cost is going to go up further. Uh, I mean, I hope that uh, there's not a lot of, of errors that happen. But now, if there is an error, you'd have to go back 10 years fixing your MDNA, or sorry, your, uh, your RSI here. And that's really expensive, especially when governments uh, don't even have a retention period, a records retention period back that long. And, and for what? I mean, financial statements are supposed to present the, the current position and the changes in that position. And, and I think long trends can be very interesting to users, but ultimately all that matters is the current condition, not how we got there. Uh, you know, all the history is encapsulated in that current condition. And I think that's what's essential. So, um, you know, our group was saying, I got some quotes from people, you know, people shouldn't be making decisions based on 10 year old information. Uh, users create their own trends. Like Robert said, I mean, er everyone, you know, they're scraping the data anyways. So you, sh you should already have that information. Um, and it wouldn't be hard to just grab it again uh, if you want to create a trend. I think it's old thinking to imagine users are like opening the financial statements and just like looking, you know, through that trend information. Uh, and I think to Matt's point, uh, this since it's a cost, like it, I think it's in the user's best interest if they want, um, if they want to uh, encourage governments to go to modified approach, let's keep the cost as low as possible to make that switch. So things like Let's not have them do 10 years of trend analysis that you literally already have in your database. And maybe if condition assessment is a barrier, then you could address that too. So thank you. Hey, Harriet. Harriet Richardson, Association of Local Government Auditors. I agree with what Scott just said. And um, uh, even as a user, how, how helpful is 10 year old data? The condition, the current condition, and whether you plan to maintain it, what you're disclosing on what you're going to, uh, how much you're going to put into maintaining it is really what's important because that's going to tell users of the financial statements either it's going to deteriorate more quickly than you expect or is going to stay at its current level or uh, get better um, by what you put into it. So I don't really care about what, what it looked like 10 years ago. I care about what it looks like today. Juliana? Yeah, for us, I see. I, I am one of the users that opens up the financial statements and looks at the ten years, and I, I find it useful because if, if the idea is to put this type of information in there, in terms of like the reinvestment into the capital asset, and I see that you're doing it consistently for ten years, that matters to me. That information matters to me. So I, I actually do like the ten years, um, for that reason, and given the nature of the type of assets that we're looking at. Rob. Rob Weber, Bond Raiders. Uh, I agree with Scott. Um, I'm, I'm taking that information in on an annual basis. That information's in my systems. If the, if it's something that we want to track, we can pull it from the database. And there's the, each of the each year, year's audit. There's no reason to go out ten years. Uh, Stephen. Stephen Stewart, Governmental Research Association. I just also wanted to echo Scott's comments about the potential to, if you could shorten the trend information, you could possibly get, that's another way to lower costs and maybe again, encourage more people to adopt the modified approach. Matt? Uh, Matt Harvey, Insurance Industry Investors. So if, if I take off my bond uh, insurance, you know, bond analyst hat, and I put on my uh, kind of more concerned citizen type hat, that's where, and I hate to use this phrase, where the, the less sophisticated users of this information don't necessarily have the databases that we have. They don't have credit scope. They don't have the system that Moody's uses. They might not have another way to get at this type of trend information. Now, I understand that in terms of the number of those that are out there versus the number of the more sophisticated users that are, are looking at this, it, it's probably a smaller concern, but that's while I, I agree from my chair uh, with everything that uh, we're saying about, you know, the, we don't necessarily need the 10 years, 
uh, for some folks that don't have access to these databases and these other things, that might be helpful for them. Michelle? Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Um, maybe surprisingly, but we, we agreed with this. Um, we actually liked the, the horizon uh, and kind of the, the 10 years for each of these. We thought it wouldn't be very difficult to continue to present the information. You've got the information and the cost to put it in, you know, the financial statements we didn't think was that significant. We thought it would pre present pretty good trend information, so we were supportive of it. Any others? So uh, for our group, again, we were split. Uh, one of them said people can just go grab past ACFRS if they wanted to go back. So maybe the less sophisticated users could go back and grab the trend information from three, four, five years ago's ACFR. Um, but back to you, Scott. Okay. Uh, the next section talks about current existing disclosures to that required supplementary information. Uh, and there are three of them. Uh, the first of which is the basis for the condition assessment and the measurement scale used. Uh, the second is the condition level at which the government intends to preserve its eligible infrastructure assets. Uh, and then third is any trends uh, that are affecting the information that's being reported. Uh, and so when the board deliberated those three disclosures to the RSI, uh, they determine the first two I mentioned, that is the basis for the condition assessment measurement scale, uh, and then the condition level that the government intends to keep its infrastructures at, also meets the definition of notes to dis, uh, financial statements. Uh, and so they tentatively decided not to include it as RSI and to have that be included with uh, what staff is doing uh, user outreach with users uh, to determine uh, whether the essentiality criteria uh, is being met and getting information on how users uh, would use that information. Uh, for the third item, uh, trends in financial statements, uh, the board tentatively decided to continue to have that be presented with the RSI uh, that we talked about in the uh, first question. Uh, so because those are two different decisions, we split the questions similarly. Uh, so the first question deals with those first two, the condition assessment, uh, and the level at which governments intend to keep their information structure assets. Do you agree uh, with the board's tentative decision that uh, to consider putting those in notes to financial statements and why or why not? Suzanne? Yeah, Scott Devaney with AGA. Yeah, our group would concur with Suzanne. Um, everyone just strongly preferred just keep it all in one place uh, and and splitting it is, uh, you know, burden, extra burden for preparer and for uh, the user. Uh, you know, we respect this question. I, I think the concept state, you know, with the concepts, uh, you know, these accounting policies have more to do with um the you know what's presented in rsi that is explaining the condition level rather than what's recognized the amounts recognized in the financial statement so i i don't think that you know our group saw this as a conceptual concern thank you other feedback michelle michelle waterworth aicpa uh we agree with scott um we tried to see the point that this would meet the definition to be in the footnotes but to us, it really presented more operational context rather than other finance-related information. So we, we had a difficult time getting on board with this being in the notes to financial statements. And then, of course, we struggled with the same thing that Suzanne mentioned as well. All right, uh, so Robbie Hamilton, NASAC, um, we don't use the, the modified approach in Oregon, but the states that participate in our committee that do were of the same opinion as Suzanne. So, back to you, Scott. Okay, and then for the third disclosure uh, that's currently required uh, in notes to RSI, do you agree with the board's standard decision to continue to require trends that significantly affect that information that's presented uh, to be presented as notes to RSI? Bob? Bob Scott, GFOA, and I would say yes, because one of the things that struck me over the years trying to maintain infrastructure, trying to predict useful lives, is it is so dynamic. And I think all of us are aware of severe weather seems to be increasing, and you have drought conditions, 
that will definitely affect your infrastructure or rainy conditions and then wildfire. I mean, let's let's list the things that could affect that infrastructure assessment. And I think if you don't comment on those things and the trends you're seeing affecting the infrastructure, then it's not nearly as meaningful to the user. So yes, I would think you have to have those things in there to it's almost like a little mini MDNA of explaining this is the trend and why. Scott? Yeah, Scott Devinny with AGA. Um, yeah, we, we agree. If the RSI is going to present this long trend, then you got to have some level of context with it. Uh, I say that, you know, regretfully because, um, you know, uh, just to pile on this long trend, this is one of the reasons why, why I don't agree with long trends in there is because you're levying three levels of historical context on preparers, the, the current, the notes for the current period, the MDNA for three years, and now, now 10 years of context. And I think to Bob's point, you know, maybe I'm a little biased because I'm from Washington State. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on in the last 10 years. It's just so hard. And, and um, you know, I, I can't I can't suggest anything different if the long trend is going to be there. Uh, then then this would be the requirement that you would continue to have. But I just want to point out that that context, like the amount of that context is being put onto the prepare to decide how much. So uh, just a reason why. With question two, we still, <laughs> I really disagree with question two. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. Yes, we absolutely agreed with us. You know, we've, we've seen the value of notes to RSI. I mean, yeah. I think of the pension and the OPEB standards. If you didn't have that, I think a reader wouldn't have all the context for the changes. And so similarly here, we think it's really important to have that ability to disclose to a reader what happened. So, I mean, things like, a government changing its desired condition level, for example, or changing its measurement scale. I mean, that's really important and should be disclosed. Joni? Joni Davis, American Public Power Association, and I'm mostly interested in the next two, but I did just want to um, agree with something that was said. Over that long period, what we have seen since some of these supply chain issues are ridiculous increases in prices. So it might be misleading that people think that all this more money is being spent when really it is price levels have just mm -hmm. skyrocketed. Level of effort it's changed. just, I know. So that's my only concern about tr trying to do a long period of time without having some type of adjustment for dollars. So, Matt? Matt Harvey, insurance industry investors. So uh, I, I do agree that, you know, presenting yes i i do think if you, you need to talk about this for for the trends i understand scott's concerns and i absolutely agree with them but if it makes him feel any better i've never seen this in the wild to begin with so i just don't think you're gonna have to do it so it's okay yeah no problem matt and and if it makes you feel any better i've never seen in the wild uh, a concerned citizen that gets to page 100 on the hopper so fair enough all good Any other, Suzanne? Suzanne Lowenson, um, American Accounting Association. Not to to uh, go down another path, but with the SEC final rule coming out and a lot of disclosures about climate-related risks, um, it's something that we're going to have to, the guys will have to consider at some point. So it's like more disclosures in something about climate-related risks is not a bad thing to consider. All right, uh, Elizabeth. Susanna, I think you're you're right, but the SEC does not have um, the ability to push those onto governments. They don't have authority over them. Now, will they, to Lisa's point, vol voluntarily want those disclosures? Yes. Um, should people do that? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, no. I don't care what you say, Lisa. No, I'm not saying I agree with it. <laughs> but it I, I don't no, love but it, it either. Is, it but is it, out yeah. there and they will, it will creep. And I agree that it's, that's a valid point. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there it's, to think about not yeah. that I'm not a, that I'm voting for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so 
for us, Rob Hamilton from NASAC, we agreed with question four. Um, question five, back to you, Scott. Okay, uh, in the last section uh, of the paper are issues the board considered uh, additional RSI and then also supplementary information that is uh, currently encouraged uh, by the uh, uh, current standards. We'll take them one at a time and I'll just talk about the additional RSI the board considered. Uh, the board also considered adding RSI requirements uh, for all infrastructure assets, regardless of whether the modified approach is used or not, uh, that governments present uh, the amount that they estimate will be necessary uh, to be to maintain and preserve the infrastructure assets, as well as comp uh, included a comparison to the actual expenditure. So they would uh, present uh, the amount they expect to preserve their assets at that was considered at the beginning of the year and the actual amount uh, spent. And the board tentatively decided to uh, require governments to do that for all infrastructure assets. So that's uh, the fifth question is whether you uh, agree with that tentative decision of the board. Uh, just a quick time check for folks. We've got about 15 minutes. So when we got this question, the next one's still to go. So uh, start with Michael. I would say yes. I mean, depreciation may not have anything to do with reality, especially as we talk about uh, inflation um, and how that changes over time and what it would actually take to maintain or replace an asset uh, of infrastructure. The question I had is, where it says uh, to preserve, well, to preserve to what level? To the current level, if that if the current level is inadequate, um, it really should be improved to maintain its long, you know, uh, its life. Then it really should be more than more should be spent than to preserve today's level. That may or may not be, you know, multiples of what the depreciation is. So I think that clarification uh, may be helpful. Uh, so, Lisa, you don't have to follow Matt. I'm having you, then Matt. Okay. Lisa Washburn, NFMA, and I thank you, Rob. Um, no, I also agree. Um, I think that any information that we can get on whether or not money, well, how money is being spent to maintain assets, but I do agree with what Michael said, that you have to know what the, the benchmark is that you're trying to reach in order for that number to be meaningful. So, Matt, then Scott. Uh, Matt Harvey, insurance industry investors. Yes, absolutely uh, agree with this decision. Um, you know, to to Michael's point, uh, does historical costs have its problems? Yes, absolutely. But this at least moves us in the right direction. So yes, yes, please. Um, but to the point that both Lisa and Michael made, there's some context missing. So again, it, it's it's maintaining that relative to what. So if we could. It would be wonderful if we could get that additional little bit of context too, uh, but this this would be a fantastic move in the right direction. All right, Scott, and then Bob. Yeah, Scott Davini, AGA. Yeah, this is the dream, Matt. Like, let's require everybody to do this. Yeah, so our group strongly disagrees. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just because uh, it would, we were basically ex asking every government to do the modified approach behind the scenes, basically keep two sets of books, which is, you know, what the cost, you know, decision uh, is right now. Uh, some governments find it less costly to do modified approach, and that's why they do it. Some governments, uh, most, almost all governments find it less costly to do historical. Um, but I, I just want to reiterate what Michael said, because that's exactly what our group picked up on, is they're like, there's, it, the information is not going to be reliable at all unless you, unless you are also presenting your condition assessment and your condition level. Um, and so we, we just felt like if you start going down this road, like you're basically just going to have to either require everyone to do modified approach or you're going to end up with information that's not actually useful decision useful bob and then joni well stated scott from aga i i agree totally this is kind of an unfunded mandate if you're not doing condition assessments you have no what idea what it is to preserve and in in fact this almost sounds like a more restrictive requirement than if you're using the modified approach because it simply says preserve. Well, preserve to me keeps at the same level. If I'm a brand new city and my average infrastructure is 90, 
I know over time it's probably going to be going down because it's simply not worth doing major rehab on streets that are still very serviceable. And so I I don't know what, I would not know what to do with that in terms of, am I now going to have to have condition assessments? I think what most governments would do is simply provide what they budgeted last year for uh, maintaining streets and call that good. And I'm not sure that's really what you're looking for, but I think that's how governments would comply with the standard. Uh, we'll go to Joel first. Thanks. I, I appreciate the discussion. At the board, we had a big discussion about this word preserve. And actually, I think what we ended up agreeing to was maybe either maintain and preserve or either just maintain. So if we changed it to disclose the amount budgeted and the actual amounts incurred to maintain infrastructure assets so that they reach their estimated useful life. Whatever it is the government has to do then, is that an easier or more workable approach? And is it still good information for users? So I, I guess I'd be interested in if we change that word. I know the question says preserve, we change it to maintain and that's the context. Is that helpful? I think in essence, that's what governments are going to give you anyways, because they're just going to give you their budget number. And I would argue that depending on the detail of a government's budget, you could probably pull it out just from the budget itself, going to the public work streets uh, cost center and find that information. So that wouldn't be overly burdensome talking about how much we spend to maintain roads. And then you could trend it over time and see if that amount's going up, going down, staying about the same. Joni? Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. I agree with things that, uh, statements made by Scott and Bob from a utility industry that this really concerns me as to what these disclosures might look like. We have several other performance metrics we use to make sure that we do have reliable electric service, like equivalent availability factor and so forth, plus just the extent of the assets. It would just be very difficult. We would pretty much what you say, just have to say this is what was budgeted for maintenance, but it would really not be meaningful because as you have what's in the budget, many of our things that are budgeted in maintenance are in like blankets. You're going to use them where you need to use that maintenance. Or maybe if there is something going on with your regional transmission organization, you're not going to take a plant down or something like that and do the maintenance. You're going to defer that because the power is needed. It's, it would be really, really difficult to provide meaningful information. And I, so maybe you could exclude, exclude business type activities like public power utilities. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my suggestion. I, I, Thank you very much. <laughs> but Joni, Joni, can I ask a question on that, though? Yeah. Because part of this is a conversation about the idea that preserve is kind of a modified approach concept and maintain is actually a historical cost concept. So you're saying you wouldn't know what you spent on maintenance? Oh, we know what we spent on maintenance. But that's what, but that's, what Joel was, that's what Joel was asking. Yeah, so it's not going to be so meaningful. And I do have to tell you, like, one of our wind farms is getting close to being done. We'll be done within the next five years. So you're saying you decide to spend different amounts on things because, you know, the end of life is coming up. You know, it's it would be hard to give meaningful information about all of the assets. Even on the lines, you have drones going around trying to find out where there are issues to maintain them and Sometimes you don't know what those are until you've done those surveys through those years. So No, I think what, what folks are talking about now, at least what, what the board's been talking about, is the idea of right now, a lot of the user community wouldn't even know the maintenance number. They, they wouldn't see that even in the disclosure right now. So that's a piece of information they would have. They don't have today. Now, it might be trends would tell you things over time and stuff and things like that. And Matt, I might be talking to you. I'm sorry if I am. But like that was at least the conversation. So part of this is about is it a, is it a word problem, which we're using preserve. We should really have preserve be about the, about the modified approach. And maintenance would be about historical cost, and folks would know that, which I think Bob picked up on pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, Stephen, you're, you're next, then we'll go to Matt. Uh, Stephen Stewart, Governmental Research Association. Uh, I think what Alan's saying makes a lot of sense with, you know, think about it as maintenance. You know, if you're pretty, this is a done in the context of a historical cost. 
presentation. So, you know, framing it as maintenance would be good. Uh, we agree as a, as a group with the board's decision uh, or tentative decision. The you know this would add new accountability. It would offer a clear picture of the government's commitment to repair and replace infrastructure, which I think we're lacking right now in a lot of ways. Just on just as citizens kind of understanding that. Um, you know, the government's, you know, just even if it's on just a basic kind of maintenance level, you know, it it, sh it shows you some a number you can track over time so that you can tell, you know, is the government trying to be an effective steward of these resources? Our members did have some caution about governments needing clear guidance on acceptable me methodologies for making the estimates. I think this goes to some of the points that Scott and others are raising. Um, you know, we we feel it's important to support the value to financial statement users, financial statement users of both comparisons across agencies and also longitudinal analysis for single governments. Um, we also thought that smaller governments would have uh, greater difficulty. Maybe this is obvious, just undertaking the estimates. They have limited infrastructure funding to, be, to begin with, and maybe less able to afford the level of quality engineers and consultants that might be required. One, one of our members suggested as a possibility to consider, uh, if you're trying to avoid overburdening governments, and you could think about requiring them to disclose something like condition ratings as opposed to conducting a full-fledged condition assessment or reporting that. Um, there are some states, I think Wisconsin, this came from one of our Wisconsin members that you know, the state has a 10 point rating scale that might be, um, you know, possible model to look at. But overall, we feel, you know, this initiative is a good move for GASB just to offer users and the public greater information about, um, you know, infrastructure assets, especially since the historical cost approach is predominant. Thanks. All right, Matt, then Michelle. Oh, Matt Harvey, uh, insurance industry investors. So to, to Joel's question and to Alan's clarification, yes. If it's the difference between one word and another, and, and to me, the distinction is not meaningful enough that I want to fight for one of the, over the other, especially if it means that I'm going to get closer to the thing that I want, then yes, that's, that's fine by me. And I, I think just to put a little bit of a finer point on it, the important thing for us is not necessarily – the difference in any one year or any two years or any three years. It's the difference between those two numbers, again, whatever the baseline is, over an extended period of time. Because then once you start to sum up those numbers, that's where we start to get at our deferred maintenance concept. That's where we get at, have you been funding this all along? Or is this or is this large you know, capital liability out there that you're going to have to expend at some point? Because that's, that's really the number that we're trying to get there. And if maintain versus preserve gets us there, then, then let's go with maintain. Michelle. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA. So we would have been where um, both Scott and Bob would have been um, definitely in disagreement. But Joel, what you said to me is a game changer. I think governments have that information, um, which was part of our concern is the, the availability of that information and how would they get it. Um, so I agree with the, the proposal as restated. Joni, do you still have some follow-up comments? Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. And I understand, and I did look in our financial statement, because most utilities, public power utilities, follow that FERC uniform standard of accounts. And there are separate accounts for maintenance than there are for operations. But at the level that I was reported, sometimes, like even in the financial statements that I looked at for our utility, we combined operations and maintenance. But I just was still trying to plead that I don't know if there's anything comparable on the, because we are a business type activity and we have all these other requirements. I mean, our mission and vision is all about reliable electric service. I don't, I just am trying to um, evaluate the costs versus the benefits of having this additional reporting requirement because I don't see that there's an issue. But then I do have to say, being totally honest, I do worry about some utilities with sewer. But I just uh, don't know that they're maintaining that infrastructure and it might be, be something totally different. But just trying to make sure that, the, that what is being requested is meaningful information and that um, just trying to make sure we do try to follow business type activities and some of the 
FASB guidance, even though we follow GASB, for sure. That's our hierarchy. <laughs> but just trying to make sure that uh, we are providing meaningful information. Thank you. So for me, uh, Rob Hamilton, NASAC, uh, we were also um, not in favor of this proposal. Um, I think, in, as I've heard of the discussion, Joel, when you had mentioned maintenance, I've, I've long think we could definitely provide our actual costs for our repairs and maintenance on our infrastructure assets. I am concerned about getting information on the plan amount uh, because states specifically all budget a little bit differently. We don't budget to repairs and maintenance for our infrastructure. And as Joni said, we have ability to budget at a higher level, which is our legal level of control. Then we have a lower level, which kind of is more of a plan. Uh, so it would be a little bit harder to get into an infrastructure repairs and maintenance specific number. Um, and I, so that would be a challenge. Um, I would much rather be in favor of doing some ratios and being able to show what's our capital asset infrastructure versus our repairs and maintenance. If there's a trend over that, that allowed some of the users to extrapolate out what that might mean, um, because I think it, being able to pull from the accounting system is certainly something that we can do. It's the planning number, which is a lot harder for us to zero in on, uh, and then what the burden that would put upon uh, states around figuring out what that, what how to how to zero in on something around that. Um, so that's the feedback that I have. Um, we have one question remaining, and we are at time. Uh, do we keep going for a little bit? Okay, sounds good. All right, Scott, over to okay. you. Okay, and the last question is another issue the board considered, as I said before, and it's something in the current literature in Statement 34 uh, that the board encourages information uh, for governments uh, to present that as supplementary information as well, especially if they provide information similar to what is provided uh, related to uh, the modified approach. Uh, the board has tentatively decided in this current project not to uh, add that as a, a continued encouragement. And so the final question in the paper is, do you agree with that uh, tentative decision of the boards? Joni Davis, American Public Power Association. I would agree that we should not do that. Yes. <laughs> I just rem didn't remember if this was the question that had the not. <laughs> Michelle? Yes, thank you. Michelle Waterworth, AICPA, 120% agree. <laughs> Matt? Yeah, even I agree with this. Bob, I'm going to let that in. Matt's comment in the conversation. Anyone else want to jump into the fray? All right, we were in agreement as well. All right, I think uh, that concludes our agenda for today. So.